Nandia Lai. Uh, hello, everybody. A very good evening to one and all of you. We are back to you with our webinar on glaucoma update series, and this time it's on glaucoma surgeries. And I'm sure it's going to be very relevant to all of you. The best of expert panel and our top notch speakers, as you would have gone through it, would be delving on the various topics of glaucoma surgery. We have for you on the expert panel, Dr. BK Nayak, our president elect and a glaucomatologist of very great standing from Mumbai to steer the course of this webinar. Dr. Varun Nayak, besides spearheading the Glaucoma Society of India, has been the general secretary of AIOS and has initiated this wonderful concept of webinar some years ago, which today is like a boon in the times of need. Dr. Krishna Das, a senior consultant in glaucoma at Arvindai Hospital's Madurai, has been actively involved in patient care, training, and clinical research for the past three decades, and has co-authored publications in glaucoma epidemiology, genetics, and clinical trials. It's indeed an honor to have you on our panel, Dr. Krishna Das, as always. Dr. Tanuj Dada is an eminent professor of RP Center and who has held prestigious posts at the Secretary, International Society of Glaucoma Surgery, Senior Chair Associate in the Advisory Board of World Glaucoma Association, on the Board of Directors of Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society, is the Chief Editor Journal of the current Glaucoma Practice and Associate Editor in the Journal of Glaucoma, and has over 300 index publications to his credit. We are honored to have you with us, Dr. Tanuj Dada. Thank you. Dr. George Putra, our moderator, along with me, currently heads the Department of Glaucoma at Arvindai Hospital's Madurai and is actively involved in teaching and training residents, fellows, and practicing ophthalmologists. He does a great job of this. His area of research interest is in the use of glaucoma drainage device in refractive glaucomas, and he has worked as closely with uh, Orolab in the evolution and the widespread use of an aff affordable aqueous drainage implant. Dr. Satyan, who's the other moderator with us, is the director of Satyan Eye Care Hospitals and is also the member of AOS Managing Society and the same in TNOA, past president of uh, Coimbatore Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon and also a past honorary general secretary of GSI. His areas of interest is he is in the process of developing new devices for medication application and improving the utilization of services of patients with GPS monitoring. He has held various leadership posts and has had extensive training in glaucoma in the institutes world over and has an amazing set of awards of excellence which reflects his dedication and commitment and a person to reckon for glaucoma services. Our first speaker in this webinar is Dr. Vinay Nangya. And Dr. Vinay Nangya, as we all know, has been trained from Shankar Netralia and then at Manchester University where he obtained his FRCS and completed his fellowship in glaucoma at Harvard. So very impressive personality. And is currently the director of Suraj I Institute the former president of GSI, and has 130 publications, including more than 40 in the Lancet. You could start uh, screen sharing, Dr. Vinay. Yes, I'll do that. We're going to be talking on decision-taking in glaucoma surgery. I think it is of very great relevance to us, and he's going to take us through all those nuances. On to you, Dr. Vijay. Th thank, thank you. I'm just going to start. Uh, everyone can see my screen? Yes, yes. Thank you. So I'm going to take you through a talk on decision taking in glaucoma surgery. One of the most difficult decisions, as many of us would agree, is that of recommending trabeculectomy. This is largely so because of the uncertainties involved. Can we do without surgery at this time? Can we change the medication? Is this a one-off elevated intraocular pressure? Am I sure that there has been progression? Is my patient non-compliant? Will the surgery be successful? Will there be a wipe out of the remaining central field of vision? Will reducing the intraocular pressure prevent further deterioration? Is there some other cause of glaucoma progression? Will the patient benefit at all? Will his personal life improve? Will his professional life improve? What is the cost of glaucoma surgery to him? Will there be any complications? So glaucoma surgery may be indicated as a primary procedure. It may be secondary following primary failure, or it may be associated with cataract surgery. It may be a tube you are thinking about, or it may be MIGS. We will consider some of these situations to give a view to the trials and tribulations of the mind while making a decision for glaucoma surgery. 
So here we have, we have the same disc, the same patient, different features and different management. So with an intraocular pressure of in 18 millimeters of mercury, supposing let's say he's on two medications, you know, we would say, let's just wait, let's not do anything. With an intraocular pressure of 21 millimeters of mercury and still two medications, we would say, let's add a third medication. With an intraocular pressure of 24 millimeters of mercury and on three medications, we would then consider surgery. So this is a 43 year old female and with the best corrected visual acuity of six by six, you can see that uh, the intraocular pressure was about 19 in the right eye and 17 in the left eye on beta blockers. The right eye though shows uh, uh, a significant notch superiorly and a large cup. And uh, you can see that there is significant retinal nerve fiber layer loss also. So what do we do with a patient like this? For the time being, we are just watching. We're looking for progression. And if there is any progression, then I think that we would perhaps either increase the number of drops uh, or we may consider something else. But for the time being, we just watch actually. This is a 68 year old with the best corrected visual acuity of six, nine in both eyes. The preoperative intraocular pressure was about 21 millimeters of mercury. And uh, at that time, he was not on any medication. After putting him on beta blockers and prostaglandins, the intraocular pressure reduced to 16 and 18 millimeters of mercury. He was pseudophagic to start with. And we then took a decision that we would do trabeculectomy in both eyes, considering that we were a little unhappy with compliance and other things. And you can see that the retinal nerve fiber layer is really short, except for the fact that the macular retinal nerve fiber layer is still not as thin and has really not bottomed out actually. So the post-operative intraocular pressure was well controlled. And uh, so we, we were fortunate that the trabeculectomy worked and, um, and perhaps we may have made a right decision actually. This is a patient who came to us and she had a very thin sclera and it was very hard to make a decision actually because she had very poor vision in both eyes and um, she had staphyloma that you can see uh, in the photograph of her eyes and uh, superiorly also the sclera was very thin. And when we did take a decision after explaining everything, you can see the flap that I'm dissecting was extremely thin and unfortunately buttonholed when I put one of the, uh, when I passed the needle to take a suture because it was so thin, just tore a little bit actually. And we could see the fluid coming out and we sensed that it's not going to work out if we had to leave the patient be. So we actually put a scleral flap on this area, uh, a, a donor scleral flap on this area. And, uh, and uh, in spite of that, there was significant hypotony for the first week. Um, and fortunately now the intraocular pressure has increased, but the bleb doesn't seem so good. So these are the travails of taking on surgery. Sometimes, you know, you, you, you want to do the best, but sometimes you don't know actually. Let's take a couple of cases for primary angle closure glaucoma. So decision-making revolves around the presentation and the level of disc damage, pressure reduction, and as soon as you can is an ins inescapable fact in PACG. This is achieved either by doing trabeculectomy alone, by combined lens and glaucoma surgery, or by lens surgery alone. The ability to predict what might serve the purpose adequately in a given patient is still open for discussion. However, one cannot go very wrong by choosing either of the above except for the possible complications that are inherently associated with each of the options. So this was a 60 years old male who was diabetic, hypertensive, uh, presented with dip pain and diminution of vision in the right eye. The right eye had a vision of hand movements and the left eye was 6'6". Six, six. The right eye had chronic angle closure with 360 degrees sanicare. The intraocular pressure was very high on, uh, on uh, four topical medications and uh, the lens thickness was high and the anti-chamber depth was uh, very shallow. And he underwent a combined surgery in the right eye knowing that you know, we, are, we are not looking for great visual outcomes, but that we wanted the intraocular pressure to be controlled so that his quality of life would uh, increase significantly and he might retain whatever little vision he had. And uh, he underwent suture lysis and bleb needling and the last follow-up at six months 
the intraocular pressure was 18 millimeters of mercury on two topical anti-glaucoma medications. And you can see here the right eye, the disc is really short. And you can see that there is significant thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And the infrared image shows uh, macular changes, whereas the left eye, disc, and the retinal nerve fiber layer were healthy, actually. This is the second patient, 51-year-old male, and the left eye intraocular pressure was 48 millimeters of mercury. He was having episodes uh, of colored halos lasting for a few hours since the last six months. He had total sinical closure, and the lens thickness was 5.25, and the chamber was extremely shallow. He also underwent combined surgery, and on last follow-up, on two anti-glaucoma medication, the intraocular pressure was 22 millimeters of mercury. And you can see that the left eye, uh, I think we're, we're going to be able to save the vision. Uh, and you can see the changes in the retinal nerve fiber are very interesting. There's retinoschiasis, there's a sawtooth appearance that you're getting this patient. And this is something that happens because uh, of acute episodes of ri rise in intraocular pressure. Uh, the retina just seems to give way because you know circulation gets blocked out very significantly, whereas the right eye is doing quite well, actually. Let's go and uh, take a look at some glaucoma implants, actually. So the decision-making in glaucoma implants varies from surgeon to surgeon. In general, if there is evidence that in a cl given clinical situation, trabeculectomy may not do too well, then it is important to consider the use of a glaucoma implant. This is a kogan reese syndrome. This lady came to us with a vision of 618, with very high intraocular pressure of 52, the right eye angles were close 360 degrees and you can see the nodules in the right eye and the distorted pupil. And uh, we did a primary uh, uh, Ahmed the glaucoma valve implant and you can take a look that, um, you know, she came back uh, four days later with a complete flattened anterior chamber with the cornea touching the lens and it was so scary actually. And we, this happened three times. We reformed the anterior chamber and then within a day, she would come back like this. And we opened up and to our surprise, we found that there was excessive drainage in an Emmett's glaucoma valve, you know, something that I, hadn't, I wasn't aware of before because it's the only thing that the valve is not working well. And that's supposed to mean that the intraocular pressure might be, might be very high. But this was a case where we could see the fluid gushing out actually from the valve. And so we actually... Um, uh, we put a suture uh, in the tube just like we do for the Adi valve and we narrowed the lumen and you can see in the bottom right hand corner, uh, you know, she's now doing extremely well and the cornea has recovered almost completely. So there are times when you think you're making a great decision and, and you have a setback that, you know, makes you repeatedly then go back to the patient and try and do the best you can actually. This patient did very well because she came to us with uveitis. The uveitis was not responding the way that we wanted to. And the pressures were very, very high. She's very young. The right eye disc has already started giving way. And on maximal medical therapy, nothing was working, actually. And so we decided to take her for a glaucoma implant. And uh, she's done uh, pretty well in the right eye. And um, so, so these are sometimes very difficult decisions and you just keep on hoping that you made the right decision, actually. And I'd just like to bring this up just to, you know, put into perspective that there's something called translaminar Cabrosa pressure differential. That's the difference between the intraocular pressure minus the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. We don't know how important it is, but it's considered to have a role to play that we don't completely fully understand, actually, but that it may be important in the development of glaucoma. That's what all the studies have shown so far, actually. And the challenge to us is that if you have a patient with an intraocular pressure of 18 millimeters of mercury, but the TLCPD is high, you may reduce the intraocular pressure to get a response, perhaps by even resorting to surgery after exhausting medical management. The second scenario is that if the intraocular pressure is only 18 millimeters of mercury, but let's say you knew the TLCPD, you could calculate it and it was normal. Then the decision still needs to be made, but we may not be able to predict if reducing the intraocular pressure any further will help. So there are challenges when you take into consideration, you have a bird's eye view of the multiple factors that could be involved at different levels of intraocular pressure. Then I think decision-making becomes, becomes a little challenging and, and one needs to be a little thoughtful. 
thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. It was a wonderful talk. Made it very interesting for us. Dr. George? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Nangi. As usual, a very practical point of view on decision making. I have a question for Dr. Nayak here. Uh, a patient, a 50, 52 year old patient comes in with very advanced glaucoma on maximum medicines. Pressure is about 30 millimeters of mercury. On a 10 2 program, one of the paracentral points are affected. So, how, how important is it? How practical does it? Does your decision on doing a trabeculectomy get influenced by the so-called uh, wipeout phenomena? Have you, have you seen one in your practice or you would still go ahead with your trabeculectomy? Dr. Knight? You are, not, you are muted. Dr. Knight, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. George. So it's a very pertinent question and, and many times you come across cases like this and always everyone's mind, the fear is that if I operate or this type of situation, the patient is going to have a wipeout phenomena. But, uh, fortunately, the reported literature about wipeout phenomena is not high, it's just two to 5%. So it's a question of if you have missed in that situation, you have to really discuss with the patient properly and explain the pros and cons then let the both party be a partner in taking decision because it's a question of you have to choose whether if the vision goes suddenly, probably you are held responsible and that is the reason why you are held back. But on the other contrary, if you don't do anything and just continue with whatever scenario you described, pressure of 30 with maximum medical therapy, and in that scenario, if you just continue, then it's a basically slow poison that they're going to the patient. So if you explain properly, then I don't think the surgeon should be really fearful about uh, operating in these situations. Of course, you have to take all precautions that there should not be excessive hypotony and for prolonged hypotony period. But uh, otherwise, if you explain to the patient, most of the time they, they, they follow this, your advice and they agree for this. And fortunately, I have not seen, means myself, I have not got any wipeout phenomena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And uh, Dr. Krishnadas, I have a question for you. Um, you are there, not muted. Dr. Krishnadas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when would you advise a stage surgery and when would you advise to go for a combined procedure? You could take some striking example. Stage surgery would be when lens changes are very minimal or not very significant. And on the other hand, glaucoma damage is far extensive where I think uh, a combined surgery would uh, take longer time and uh, uh, it would be more risky to operate. So if uh, glaucoma is predominant, pressures are high with maximal medications, probably I would like to stabilize the disc first with a warning that the patient would soon require a cataract surgery in the immediate, uh, immediate uh, future. That would be the approach for combined, uh, for uh, uh, isolated trabeculectomy. Combined, of course, mild to moderate, uh, uh, which are uh, fairly well controlled on medications, but where you require uh, uh, a re decreased need for medications in the post-operative period, a lesser target pressure, and where is there, there is definitely some lens changes, uh, probably a combined approach. And in all angle closure glaucoma, I would come, um, I would, uh, I would uh, suggest and recommend a combined procedure, even if the lens were clear. Thank you. Thank you. That was the madam, next. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Who's? Uh, Shrinivas here, madam. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, Nangya, sir, as your topic was on the uh, decision making in case of uh, glaucoma, yes. I had a quick question to you and to the yes. other panelists as well. See, in case of silicon oil filled glaucoma, where you have yes. this multiple silicon oil droplets clogging yes. into the trabecular meshwork. Yes. And uh, many of the surgeons first try to do an AC wash and do a silicon oil removal. Yes. Uh, but it's still controversial. Some says that you have to do trap at the same sitting. Some says, no, just do a silicon oil removal, do an AC wash. Because some most of the studies quote that the, once the silicon oil gets pl plugged into this trabecular meshwork, it's difficult to get dislodged. Yes. So do you advise to do uh, the trabeculectomy at the same sitting in the patients who have silicon oil glaucoma or you do it in a staged procedure? Actually, uh, uh, you know, I would, I would suggest that you don't do a trabeculectomy. Yes. Because trabeculectomies fail within a few days, actually, because there's been so much inflammation of the conjunctiva. And so we would always suggest that uh, 
one does a, a, a glaucoma implant actually. And I completely agree with you that once you have emulsified all bubbles in the anterior chamber, then they've really gone into the trabecular meshwork and they blocked it. So we, we do suggest that, you know, uh, that we do a, a glaucoma implant, uh, if possible, at the same time. Itself. Yes, it's no problems at all, actually. Yes. I think we'll go on to the next speaker and there are a whole lot of questions. And if our speakers uh, are brief in their answers, then we can take in more questions. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Harsh Kumar. You could start sharing your screen. He's a former president of GSI and currently is the director of Glaucoma Services at the Center for Site Group of Hospitals. He has numerous publications to his credit in peer-reviewed journals, recipient of very impressive awards and recognitions. And we are indeed honored to have him as our eminent speaker today. Dr. Harsh would be talking on the beginner's video guide to mastering trabeculectomy and shortening the learning curve. On to you, Dr. Harsh. Thank you, Chitra. And uh, thank you, Vinay, for clarifying Can you it. Can your volume? Uh, <coughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what uh, basically I think Vinay has clarified when we need to do this surgery. And uh, so the plan of the surgery is already made. We have to do a trabeculectomy preoperatively. Some people say you stop the PG analogs, but frankly, if you have to stop, it will be two to three weeks, which that most of the times we don't have that much time. Most of our patients are from outside, so we will not be able to do it. We do it with all medications which are there. However, blood thinners would be preferable to stop, but stop it by the doctor who has already started it. Don't go ahead and do it by yourself because we don't want excess bleeding at the time when we are operating. You must operate on a soft eye. So you be, if the pressure is still high despite all topical medications, make sure that you have given oral estazolamide, glycerol, or even mannitol if you have to do that. Currently, you have to do the COVID test. We are doing it. I don't know whether you want to do it, but I think it will be preferable for you. Any one-eyed patient, we prefer to do a conjunctival swab to make sure that there is no infection. <clears throat> also, if the conjunctiva is really bad, you can use low-dose steroids for a, one or two weeks just to make the conjunctiva a little soft. Must explain prognosis. We know that in most of our hands, wipe out never occurs but you have to tell to the patient that yes there's a possibility that you can lose vision while i operate and post operatively to get it written in the in the language of the patient by the relative or by you this is very very important <clears throat> on the uh, we usually like to give intravenous mantle around 30 minutes before that and we usually like peribulbar anesthesia with a good massage no super pinky and uh, so if you go ahead and see, basically, we like to do a corneal traction suture. And uh, uh, this is 6-0 Vicryl. And usually you put on uh, some visco over here. And though most of the time, years and years, I've learned the limbal-based flap. But ultimately, I learned. So I learned very late how to do a phonics-based flap. So I think it is so much more comfortable to make a phonics-based flap. Everything is so much more easier with it. But then, yes, you should also know the limbal based flap. Uh, <coughs> cautery should be gentle and light. And uh, you can use any kind of a blade. You can have, now this is just a 10 paisa blade, which is a Raja blade or any high carbon blade put in your handle. <coughs> and uh, you can use 11 number, you can use uh, uh, Whatever blade is comfortable in your hands, you can use that. Uh, the idea is to raise up a uh, trabecular, uh, this uh, sternal flap around four into four. You can go a quadrangular flap. Uh, all these flaps are equal. The triangular or quadrangular doesn't really make any difference. While you are making the flap, be sure if you want um, greater filtration, make a thinner flap. If you want lesser filtration, you can make a thicker flap. Uh, go into the clear cornea and uh, then you are going to be very, very careful. Many a times there's a tendency to do cautery at the edges. Please avoid that because the moment we do cautery at the edges, this uh, site will definitely leak later. And uh, you can have a sponge with mitomycin C and the 0 0.02 or 0 0.04. If it is already a, a uveitis or the NVG, then you will have to use for a longer time and be sure that the edges are not in contact with the mito. 
take it off clean it up nicely wash it up nicely so all that mito is superiorly is gone and once that part is over <coughs> you can make the internal flap uh before that invariably at least i would like to give all three sutures if i am going to put three i put all the three pre placed sutures as most of my patients have one eyed advanced glaucoma as even dr nayak was saying one of the uh, worst uh, nightmares is having a hypotony so what we would like to do is to give all three pre placed sutures so that the moment the surgery is over you can suddenly close it up and the chamber is maintained when you are making an internal block make sure that you have plenty of space on either side of the internal block so that if you make it a large one and it is near the edge then it is going to leak and the real bug bear is hypotony prolonged hypotony because it can lead to cataract formation it leads to corneal edema it can lead to hypotonic maculopathy this is what something that you really really want to avoid and that is why in all our cases we also make a side port so once we have done a we just make an internal uh, block then we go to the side port and the idea is to inject some air over there and stabilize it some people actually put a, a continuous uh, fluid infusion in this uh, area and some people don't make it at all but we love to make it because if there is a bleed you can wash it off uh, and here what you can do is cut the internal block and if you feel that the internal block is not fully cut you can later use a punch also and uh, usually you should open up the schlems kalana from either side and go into the clear cornea as well so i i do feel that you should have a side port ready at all times because it is really really helpful if there is a bleed you can wash it off if there is a sudden hypotony you can inject uh, visco over there now pi is very very important make a transverse pi so that and while you are making a pi while, while you have pulled out the iris make sure that you are seeing the pupil if sometimes the pupil is not seen what happens is the whole iris will collapse out and you start doing a peripheral iridotomy you end up doing a complete iridotomy which is very very bad for the patient because there will be too much glare and other problems so make sure the idea is to cut only that much iris so that once we have reposited and once the fluid is going out from this internal block the iris is not going to block that area so that is the very purpose of doing an iridotomy <laughs> once you have done the iridotomy uh, replace the iris just deposit it gently the chamber is still formed as you can see and then you can uh, uh, like we were already ready with all the sutures and make sure that all the sutures are buried so that the knots are not coming up because that can and now what i am doing pressing on the sides to see that yes even by gentle pressure the fluid is coming out use 80 vicral now uh, scleral conjunctiva conjunctiva some people just give a single suture here and push it everything over there you can do that as well whatever is comfortable the idea is to close this very very nicely i am really finicky because in phonics based flaps sometimes the leaking from this can be very very uh, troublesome and sometimes you have to even put a contact lens on top of that so i really try and close it well but you can some people just put a single suture from here by a vicral and just close it up what i do then after pushing the vicral sutures is that i make a mattress suture here a two mattress suture with teno uh, nylon so that the wound is completely airtight so we have one suture into the cornea into the conjunctiva back into the conjunctiva and on to the cornea so this is the way it is going so we have we are completely secured at this particular area once we are done with that we give some something conjunctival genta deca now this uh, is some previously we used to whenever we were doing the limbal base flap we would always put a verdal suture over here or a superior rectus suture which now actually i never do Uh, but you will see sunita has done it in one of the this thing then sometimes uh, you may require to do it so we will see in one of the sunita's videos as i was seeing just to show you again very very important that when you are doing this uh, corneal retraction suture it, it should be a large bite uh, so that it does not cut through while you are doing the surgery and uh, so if you are doing a limbal base flap Uh, basically you have to raise around 8 to 10 mm behind the rest of the procedure is same and when we close the conjunctiva it is closed in two layers you can uh, 
close the conjunctiva and the tenon separately or together you can take one bite from the conjunctiva and the next bite from conjunctiva tenons together and make a mattress which are all around so that the whole thing is uh, closed uh, like this. So you have a nice closure over here. <clears throat> now, like I was saying that in case the, this doesn't seem adequate to you, you can always use a punch, always easy. It's a very inexpensive device. You all must have a punch when you're doing a trabeculectomy and you can cut it posteriorly so that you have an adequate opening and the white and the uh, gray zone, the, that is the area where the Schlems canal lies and that you must be able to uh, open up. Now, uh, most of the people who do not have a uh, 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 argon laser, I have an argon laser, so I have literally given up because I can always use my uh, uh, argon laser to cut the sutures because it is imperative when you do a trabeculectomy. Many a times you have to cut the suture or release the suture. So this is the Kolker cast modification. And uh, so one of the releasable sutures technique you have to learn because if you don't have an argon, please always do at least one or two people do either on single site or on two sites or on the superior side, they will do it. So this is just a 10-0 standard technique. And if you are doing a phonics base flat, again, just neglect that the conjunctiva is here. The rest of the technique is absolutely similar. So you would make a four, uh, four throws from this knot and tie up the suture very nicely over here so that later when you pull it out, then this thing will open up. But believe me, many a times when you pull it out, actually it breaks and nothing happens. So sometimes if something like that happens, you may have to actually use the argon to cut the suture. And be careful, cutting the suture should be done within uh, six weeks. If you have mitomycin, yes, you can go a little longer, but by and large, by six weeks, uh, you have to cut the suture. So once this, once this knot is uh, clarified, you have a tight knot over here, which can later be, we'll just show you that some people used to just cut the suture here and pull it later, but then this rubs on the cornea. So we'll show you what we later do, but just to show you that if you now pull this up, then we will see that the internal area actually opens up. So if you, when you will later use this pull, this thing will open up. So now we'll just reapply it. And meanwhile, I'll tell you that, okay, so now this was, we are not going to leave the cut end here. So we'll take the needle and pass it through the cornea over here in some depth in a longer fashion so that the entire suture is buried and we'll pull it up and cut it here so that the end retracts into the corneal tract uh, so that nothing is exposed except a small loop over here will be exposed with the needle you can actually take out that loop and then pull the suture nicely and open up the uh, suture I think we will be able to discuss more later how and when uh, we can do that. So just pull up the suture and cut gently so that the end basically retracts. So I think there's another technique, but I have been in uh, favor of time. I will not go into it. Uh, we'll just leave this out. And I just want to tell all the youngsters in case patient requires surgeries, you are not confident please, please refer the patient. Every day, all of us see patients who should have been referred much earlier. And by the time they come to us, sometimes it is too late. I promise you a good referral will bring you more patients. So please be careful. Please uh, check everything. Try to learn me, but please also learn how to refer. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Harsh. That was truly a beginner's guide for trabeculectomy. And the bottom line is to avoid post-operative hypotony at all costs. All vision-threatening complications of glaucoma filtration surgery are more due to hypotony than raised pressures. I have a question here for Krishna, sir. Actually, now there is enough evidence in literature that intraoperative injection mitomycin can be as safe and efficacious as sponge application. Would you advise surgeons to shift over to injection mitomycin? If yes, the reason for it and the technique by which you, you, by which you give the injection, intraoperative injection mitomycin. I would recommend in primary trabeculectomies where mitomycin is indicated 
uh, one could switch over to injections. The reason is two. One is the uh, one is the ease of procedure, and it is so less time consuming. Uh, you need not have to uh, excise the conjunctiva, keep the sponge, and then wait for two minutes or uh, one minute or two minutes, whatever uh, time exposure you plan. And uh, literature has proven that efficacy is similar uh, between subconjunctival injection mitomycin and subconjunctival sponges. There is very little to choose from as far as efficacy is concerned. So with that in mind, I would like to prefer mitomycin in all primary trabeculectomies. Though in certain complicated trabeculectomies where risk is huge, one may want to have a higher exposure of concentrations or a time exposure of mitomycin. In which case, suppose you have a neovascular glaucoma photo laser, retinal laser, and you want to do a trabeculectomy, probably I would uh, suggest a sponge mitomycin where you would want to expose the uh, subcontinuous tissue for about four or five minutes. Other than that, all primary traps, yes. In primary glaucomas, yes. Injection mitomycin. Uh, the preparation, you need to dilute it further, that's all. Usually, uh, you have uh, mitomycin and uh, crystalline form, 2 milligram. You, you dissolve it in 10 ml of uh, uh, distilled water and then take 1 ml of this and then again further dilute it with 9 ml of distilled water. So that will further dilute it. And of this, you just take 0.1 ml, mix it with 0.9 ml or 1 ml of lignocaine and inject subconjunctive. That's the simplest way of doing it. Most standard texts and recent publications uh, uh, describe the process of uh, diluting. Uh, I have one question for Dr. Tanuj. Uh, is there any role of avastin or ologen in routine trabeculectomies, doctor? So, uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra. Uh, there is no role of anti vegf avastin, bevacizumab, in trabeculectomy, numerous studies have shown that it is not beneficial. Just a short time. Benefit. Center, we use Ologen for three years. And now, when we did the follow up of patient up to five years, we found that Ologen was not useful. It did not. You cannot use ologen without my mitomycin C. All cases will fail very early. To do ologen in addition to mitomycin C, there also we found that success rate was not enhanced. So we have stopped using mitomycin C. So currently, I will not recommend either using MST. Uh, mitomycin C. There was one study from Pondicherry, you know, Dr. Dr. George, about usage of avastin in trabeculectomy surgery. Yeah, yeah, it was it was published in the, the Journal of Glaucoma uh, uh, use of avastin in, uh, but I think most surgeons still uh, prefer to use uh, mitomycin. Uh, of IFU or Ologen. Okay, Chitra, can I say something? Because we had a publication, I'm Dr. Harsh here, and uh, we had a publication in ophthalmology in 2008, where we initially uh, published this technique. And I use it exclusively for patients in which mitomycin cannot be used, like, for example, in cases of high myopia, where mitomycin will give rise to choroidals. And I have had a great success with this. So ex except for everything else, this one technique where this is a place where you should or could use um, uh, any anti ah. Shall I go on to my question? Ah. See the questions later. Ah. Ah. I think uh, we have to use because we ah. have I would request everybody to vote mute excepting Dr. George because there's a lot of noise. Uh, and uh, I shall now go on to my talk on uh, early blood challenges. Uh, we all understand that even after a very successful strabiculectomy, uh, attention to detail in the post-op period is very critical and we need to be very wary of some of these telltale signs. So essentially the common blood challenges could be an early blood failure and if you nip it in the bud, we could have salvaged the trabeculectomy procedure. A blood leak, again, it could lead on to hypotony if it is not looked into early enough. And early blebitis, it could be dealt with early on. 
and of course problems due to a large blip. So it is all about how do you do your containment procedures. So for that you need to understand the risk factors in that particular eye, have the ability to recognize those early risk factors, identify the cause and prevent failure and restore function. So when we talk of risk factors, it could be young age and aggress aggressive healers in the young, a secondary glaucoma more so to a neovascular glaucoma or an inflammatory UVIT glaucoma or an anterior chamber dysgenesis. Inflammation could be as trivial as a conjunctival inflammation or a lid inflammation or a patient who's got chronically inflamed eye because of anti-glaucoma drops over years. These could be a hazardous to a bleb uh, success. Again, a previous surgery, something as trivial as a pterygium surgery or a previous SICS or a, or a retinal buckle, Afro-Asian descent. If the punch is too anterior, it could have a valvular effect that if you do a massage, you get the fluid flowing in, but otherwise the bleb is flat. Or if it is a very posterior punch, again, you would find that uh, there is a closure which is happening. If it is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, then again, the presence of fibrin and blood pigments would be definitely hazardous to the success of the bleb. You then need to look into the etiology. Is the blockage at the level of internal ostium or is it at juxtascleral at the scleral flap edge? Now that is something which can be picked up easily when you do a gonio. And you need to keep this mind, especially when you're doing a needling in these eyes, because you need to know that the flap is adherent at the scleral flap uh, margin and you need to enter that. If it could be a regular subconjunctival fibrosis or a mitomycin toxicity with a conjunctival necrosis or a blood leak or a conjunctival uh, retraction. We need to be understand the wound healing after trabeclectomy. It is largely in four phases. The coagulative phase is, is, is rather during the course of the surgery or immediately after that, where you need to catch these bleeders, you adrenaline soak sponges or do a very gentle cautery. And then you go on to the inflammatory phase in the immediate post-op where it's absolutely mandatory to increase the frequency of the topical steroid drops. The role of wound modulators are less here. Then you go on to the proliferative phase wherein you need to keep them on topical steroid drops, but the mod wound modulating agents do come in. And if there is a challenge for the bleb, you need to use these at this point of time, a 5-FU or a mitomycin. And then going on to the remodeling phase, which goes on to months. Actually, the epithelium, whether it's a functioning or a flay, uh, failed bleb, the epithelium looks similar, but when you look uh, in the sub-epithelial tissue, it's loosely arranged with clear spaces in a good bleb, and it, there's dense collagen tissue with no spaces in a, uh, a bleb which is fibrosed. An ideal bleb would have microsis. There would be positive vessels overlying the bleb, and you could compare it when you see the nasal and the temporal conjunctiva. There would be a diffuse drainage and a moderate elevation. In fact, IOP is going to be the surrogate measure and of course the appearance of the bleb help. And if you could lift the bleb on digital massage, that clues you on that the bleb is doing good and the non-invasive anterior segment OCD gives information. So a good bleb is one if the IOP is less than 14 without the AGM. If it is 14 to 18, it's a moderate bleb. But if it is more than 18, it's not a good functioning bleb. But then we also need to keep in mind at this point of time, whether the pressure at the beginning of the surgery was in 50s, and we all know that the trabeculectomy procedure just give, brings about a 30% uh, IOP drop. So in that particular case, maybe an 18 is also a successful surgeon. So then you need to look at the signs of a bleb failure. So essentially it would be a low or a flat bleb, highly vascularized as this, no microsis, quite opalescent, and you might even see a fibrotic vascular ring surrounding it, you would have an internal block possibly, and you would suddenly see that the IOP is rising. And more importantly, the bleb would not lift on massage, and gonioscopically, you would be able to make out that the scleral flap is adherent, which is indicative of a juxta uh, scleral fibrosis. Again, if you look in the ostium at during gonio, you would know that the iris is plugging, or is it vitreous, or it is blood or fibrin. The tenon cyst actually starts off with a nice raised bleb with good filtration, but then suddenly it becomes quite smooth domed. There are large vessels. The sclerostomy is patent, but there are no microcysts. And you might try using uh, aqueous suppressants in initially to bring down the filtration, but you could even try anti-inflammatory, but finally needling is what we need. The bleb can be graded as I've labeled out all these different ways, but I felt that the Indiana bleb grading is the best in the sense it clearly identifies a flat bed based on the height. 
it tells you the by clock hour basis whether the bleb how much the bleb is extensive it tells you on the vascularity of vascularity of the bleb and you could actually classify the blebs accordingly oct and uvm are also helpful in bleb imaging a multiform wall a subconjunctival separation or a hyporeflective wall are indicative that this bleb is functioning so then the next question is how do you prevent bleb failure as was earlier due to two, you need to stop the topical anti glaucoma medication preferably if you can in that scenario by for a week stop the blood thinners treat the conjunctival and the lid inflammation you could start preoperative topical steroid drops a week before do a a traumatic surgery and post op ensure that you are liberal with your anti inflammatory drops the wound modulating agents you need to ensure that there is aqueous filtration happening and be prepared to use topical steroids for 3 to 6 months as it is in your hands again if the filtration is not good the iop is going up you should use your releasable sutures of releasing it sometimes very rarely in a, within a week but largely in the second or third week if you have interrupted sutures you could do sutureizers one suture at a time and you could even in an hours interval you could remove the other suture but then when the iop is going up besides the suture release you need to be very aggressive on your anti inflammatory agents you should be prepared to use your 5fu liberally mmc drops could be used and needling is something you should be prepared to do even if it is in the early post op period again if it is a suture release with laser you could use a lens without magnification which press it on the conjunctiva blanch it and you are able to visualize a suture and cut it you could use a mag without magnification or with magnification then comes how do you manage the internal ostium block so you need to identify the etiology on gonioscopy so if it's just a, a, a fibrin or a blood clot you could try intracameral tissue plasminogen but these are costly but if it is iris which is blocking you could go in through a side port and release the iris you could do a vitrectomy if iris is blocking or in a situation you have to do an internal bleb revision now if it is a t non cyst then it largely needs a bleb revision and first you there are different studies like one ferrer et al uh, uh, talked about as, as incising the subconjunctival scar tissue pedersen and smith talked about needling and the success rate ewing and stamper talked about five few injections along with needling and they claim to have 91.6% success rate shin et al believed in just giving one injection of five few during needling and then madel et al talked about a slit lamp usage so when you do needling uh, what you need to remember is besides actually i prefer to give 3 to 7 injections of ifu in the post operative period along with early topical steroid drops which i would taper over 6 weeks and a digital massage i would also do in the post op period if indicated so first i would balloon up the conjunctiva with the injection of xylocaine with adrenaline and with my 26 gauge needle tip i would cut the subconjunctival fibrosis and the way the conjunctiva balloons up it is indicative that you are separated the subconjunctival fibrosis and i would ensure that i go comfortably and slowly all the way overlying the bleb area and then i would go deeper to the bleb once i have ensured that the subconjunctival fibrosis has been taken care of go under the bleb and continue the cutting process and go right up to the ostium and after that what i would do is i would go ahead and see that the, and i would reform the anterior chamber with air bubble and then also i would give a five few injection away from the bleb so going further if this was a case which i'm not uh, would uh, just like to show you sorry this is a case wherein the iris was blocking so i would create a paracentesis and with a blunt spatula first release the iris but then i can't stop with this because the bleb is already flat and needling has to be done so but without doing an internal ostium opening it makes no sense and then after doing that i would go on to doing my needling of the bleb as i had shown you in my earlier case but this is a situation wherein there's an epithelial defect and going on to a stromal melt so although this case demands needling the angry looking bleb i would have to treat the cornea i would have to use uh, bandage contact lens lot of lubricants then once the eye settles then only i could go in and needle this bleb the other challenge is a hypotony it could be something as basic as a small black bleak which was no unnoticed an overfiltering bleb a hyposecretion a ciliary body shutdown a cyclodiasis cleft or an effusion so what is most important is i need to plane the bleb to locate where is the leak and this 
non-stain aqueous leaking out, as in this case, would tell you that there is a blood leak. Then this was a particular case which had a thin uh, flap and uh, uh, some amount of conjunctival necrosis had set in. So the management of leaky blood, what is essential, it has been absolutely atraumatic surgery. It is said to be more common in fornix based flaps, but what is the challenge is it could lead on to end off unnoticed. You could have a flat AC, and if it is something far away and a large um, uh, blood leak, you need to suture it up and reform the AC. But if there's a small leak, you could do with a BCL, and you should leave the BCL for two to four weeks. This is a beautiful uh, journal of glaucoma uh, flow chart, which tells you that if you have an early bleed, blood leak, you need to look at the distance of the leak from the limbus and evaluate the anterior chamber status. If the anterior chamber is shallow, you need to go and suture it. But if the anterior chamber is deep, and if the blood leak is less than two millimeters, you could use your bandage contact lens of 15.5 millimeters. But if it is two to four, then I would use a larger uh, BCL. But if it is not closing, I would look at suturing beyond waiting two weeks. So this is how a blood leak was there and a bandage contact lens was placed and the anterior chamber improved. The other challenge early on is an overfiltering blood. So the, you would easily pick it up because intraocular pressure is low, but the anterior chamber is shallow and you do not want a structural or functional damage. So if it's grade one depth, I would do conservative management, maybe an autologous blood. I would do a gonio, UBM, ASO, CT. But if it is a grade two bleb, and overfiltering bleb, I would, again, if it's grade one, I could even probably taper my steroid drops. But if it is grade two, I need to reform it with air or C3 F8 gas. And if it's grade three, I have to go back and re-suture the flap edges. Ologen has its claims that it sort of regulates the aqueous filtration, but we do not want a hypotony. But if hypotony is going to set in, it brings about a breakdown of the blood ocular barrier. And then in the early stages, maybe you would do frequent tropical steroid drops, treat the leak, then you need to sometimes step on to the oral steroid drops. And then it comes to a point that really you would, when it's kissing choroidals, you just cannot sit. So then you need to actually first look at the bleb, whether the sutures have come off, whether you need to put more sutures, you could, but you need to keep reforming the AC at all times. And this particular case, we had to suture the bleb. But even after suturing the bleb, what we noticed was that the anterior chamber was not reforming. So then we had to go in and raise a scleral flap and then go on making incisions on the choroid till there is that gush of uh, straw colored yellow fluid which came in. And then I wouldn't suture this flap, I would reform the AC and then close the conjunctiva and deal with that moment. Taking you further, the, the last extreme, like this is a thin cystic bleb. So then what is necessary for us to remember that we need to do a thorough mitomycin wash. You should place your pledgets right in the posterior space and so that it doesn't come to touch the conjunctival margins. And you need to be sure you're using the right concentration. But if you have this kind of a bleb, you could use oral doxy, you could use vitamin C, but remember that you could even try a modified cornix based flap wherein there's a thrill of conjunctiva, which sort of would prevent that kind of a scenario. The last segment is the bleb-related infection or the bleb-related endophthalmitis. The percentage of occurrence in the different studies have been less, but it's more seen if you have ignored a bleb leak or you have used excess of metabolites or a medial or an inferior bleb and many more, but you could actually look at that, that telltale condition of the bleb, that minimal anterior chamber reaction. If you do not treat it now, it's going to rapidly progress. So you have to be conscious, look for those risk factors, culture the bleb discharge and start them on fortified antibiotics and please involve your vitreo retinal colleague and be prepared that this trap would fail. So there's so much which needs to be watched when you're doing an early uh, uh, post-operative period. So I would go back to my second slide and say that we need to understand the risk factors, have the ability to recognize those early telltale signs, identify the cause and prevent the failure because it's not just the anatomical success but also the visual function, which has to be restored at all times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chitra, for the beautiful overview of uh, blood challenges. For uh, interest of time, I will probably just ask two questions to Dr. Nayak. First is, what would be your post-operative steroid schedule in a post trabeculectomy eye? And second, what is the earliest you would have pulled out a releasable or done a laser suture lysis post trabeculectomy with mitomycin?
Dr. Naik? Dr. Yes, Naik? Yeah, yeah, I start, I start steroids hourly and that uh, Fred Fort and continue it for that for about 10 days and then gradually reduce it, but continue it for three months. In at least four times, three months I continue and then later on reduce it further, but sometimes maybe low steroid for say uh, lotepred or something like that, twice daily I continue it for six months. And then based on that, because it is always, it has been noticed that if you stop it early, probably it will fail late. That was the first question, steroid. So more frequent steroids and continue it for longer. That is the bottom line. The second one you are asking about when, even the first day I have released the sutures. So I have removed the releasable sutures. So it all depends what is the etiology and what is the, why, because if there is absolutely no drainage, you you press the, uh, uh, give pressure on the eyeball, there is no drainage at all, and pressure is really shooting up, then in the first day, even I have removed it. And uh, But you have to be very careful and graded matter. Thank you. Uh, you don't believe in doing a digital massage in the early post-operative period, Dr. George? Yeah, we do, but that's what Dr. Nayak was mentioning. No, even after digital massage, you're not able to raise the blood. Pressures yes. continue to be high. So you can uh, you can go early with uh, releasable suture release or laser suture releases. Dr. Vijaya, uh, could you share yes. your screen? Yes, sure. Uh, we go on to Dr. Next uh, talk. Dr. Uh, L. Vijaya is our very distinguished senior consultant of Glockma Services Medical Research Foundation. And after having held many prestigious posts at MRO, she became the president GSI and has actually held every single major post to be reckoned as a leader of glaucoma services at international levels. I was actually amazed when I read her bio data and she has received the most amazing, brilliant sets of awards and tributes and innumerable yeah. publications to her credit. It's a tribute to us to have her participating in our we uh, webinar. And I'm really lucky to have you in our ARC webinar, Dr. Vijaya. And we would like to hear your pearls of wisdom. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chitra. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, ARC AOS, particularly Chitra, for the kind invitation. I would say that Chitra has covered most of the things which I had in mind. Because of the time limit, I wisely decided I will not talk about the managing failures, which she has co covered it beautifully. I will talk about three important complications that one can see following uh, a trabeculectomy that is aqueous misdirection, blebitis and with the endophthalmitis and the lead bleb leaks. So aqueous misdirection is something which is rare, but it can happen, especially in eyes with angle closure. To understand aqueous misdirection, having a good knowledge of anatomy and physiology of the eye, particularly the middle segment of the eye is important. So what is the middle segment? Middle segment is a ciliary body, lens zonular diaphragm with the anterior vitreous. And this part is important. I will come to that. And usually when the aqueous is produced in the ciliary, from the ciliary processes, it goes in the conventional route. Other than that, part of the aqueous also goes posteriorly to the vitreous cavity. So there is always a, a balance between the normal flow of the aqueous in this way. And what does uh, this balance is maintained by? This is maintained by proximity of the ciliary process to the vitreous body and the permeability of the highlight phase. These two will get compromised whenever there is an aqueous misdirection. So factors that are responsible for the aqueous misdirection most of the times are related to the size of the eye. So it is common with the hyperopia because eye is small. So what is the initiating factor for the aqueous misdirection? Most of the times it is the sudden decompression of the anterior segment of the eye where the middle segment collapses. When does it happen? It happens in any surgical decompression that is doing the trabeculectomy in a small eyes or in maybe in the post-operative period because of the post-operative overfiltration, even a wound leak it causes the sudden collapse of the anti segment and the middle segment results in aqueous misdirection. So what happens when there is aqueous misdirection? 
the conventional flow gets compromised and the acris tends to go posteriorly because of that there will be uh, this happens because of the collapse of the middle segment because of this there will be forward displacement and progressive obliteration of the middle segment and the this keeps increasing and the vitreous gets swollen up and it causes the expansion of the vitreous and this will result in shift of the lens iris diaphragm anteriorly and causes the flat anterior chamber and whatever aqueous is being produced it tends to go posteriorly not a drop will go to the anterior part so it becomes a very difficult condition to manage so what do we see clinically whenever there is aqueous misdirection we see axial shallowing of the anterior chamber that means absolutely no anterior chamber and the entire lens iris diaphragm has moved forwards there will be presence of the patent pi that's how we differentiate it from the pupillary flow there will be usually elevated intraocular pressure except in cases where the blood is still functioning you can have aqueous misdirection even with the normal intraocular pressure and one should make sure there is no other cause for the lens iris diaphragm shift anteriorly that is mainly suprachoroidal fluid or the blood so if you see here this is a axial shallowing of the anterior chamber you see here absolutely no anterior chamber the entire lens iris diaphragm has in this case it's pseudophagia has moved forwards and it's basically disease of uh, exclusion so what are the diseases you like to exclude one is the first and foremost is the ciliary block um, pupillary block second is the choroidal effusion third is the suprachoroidal hemorrhage how do we differentiate pupillary block from malignant glaucoma they both will have the shallow anterior chamber if you examine carefully with the slit lamp in the pupillary block you will still have space between the lens and the uh, cornea and in the central part you will have space whereas with the axial shallowing it is a uniform shallowing there won't be any space that's how you differentiate looking at the anterior chamber tip the pupillary block and aqueous misdirection or popularly called as a malignant glaucoma when can it happen it can occur any time after surgery and in important times usually following suture lysis or when you keep patient on cycloplegic especially the small eyes that is angle closure eyes whenever you stop there is a possibility the lens iris diaphragm will move forwards it can cause aqueous misdirection how do we diagnose you have to do a detailed slit lamp examination gonioscopy especially for the other eye to to know whether the angle closure is the cause for it do a good indirect ophthalmoscopy to rule out the uh, effusions like a choroidal effusion or the hemorrhagic choroidal and if the view is not good enough you need an ultrasound to uh, rule out that problem and uh, to rule out the leak do the sedils to rule out the leak and as i mentioned this can ultrasonography if needed if you can't see the fundus in detail to look for at the choroidal detachment or suprachoroidal hemorrhage ultrasound by microscopy plays a huge role if you are able to do it it shows the anterior rotation of the ciliary body with the opposition to the ciliary process to the lens equator this is how it will look like ciliary process have been rotated anteriorly and you can see the plant anterior chamber here and it is abutting against the uh, lens iris diaphragm here and uh, you you can see sometimes in the same clinical picture with some amount of suprachoroidal effusion which you may miss it with the clinical examination and also on the ultrasonography because it is too peripheral and here choroidal effusion is contributing to the shallow of the anterior chamber probably these eyes will likely to respond to medication it is one of the prognostic factors if you do the choroidal effusion you can afford to wait with the conservative treatment for a longer period of time whereas if you see a clinical situation like this and these eyes most probably will require surgical intervention they may not respond to your conservative treatment and this is a scan uh, photographs showing a axial shallowing that's how the entire lens iris diaphragm has shifted forwards with the expansion of the vitreous so when we are managing it make sure you are dealing with aqueous misdirection re establish your diagnosis start with the mediatic cycloplegic therapy a yag highlighter to me can be considered 
Endometrial surgery is considered for eyes that respond does, doesn't respond to conservative treatment. And management of the fellow is very important because that needs a lot of planning and also convincing patient how important to take care of the other eye to avoid axis misdirection in the future. So what are the mediatic cycloplegic therapy? Basically, it, AC depends due to the relaxation of the ciliary body and the tightening of the zonules. Initially, the treatment was with 10% phenylephrine and 4% atropine, but it was abandoned because of the systemic side effects because of the high 10% phenylephrine and 4% atropine. The recommended drugs now is 1% cyclopentylate or tropicamide with 5% phenylephrine initially and then followed by 1% atropine for maintenance. Substantial risk of recurrence when they are stopped should be kept in mind. Sometimes we may have to keep patients on cycloplegics for longer periods of time. And uh, control the intraocular pressure with the uh, beta blockers. And we, one may have to consider hyperosmotic agents if the pressure is very high, basically to reduce the vitreous volume and improving its permeability. So IV mannitol is recommended. This is likely to have a lot of inflammation. Use the topical steroids to reduce inflammation. This is an example of an eye with that responded to the mediatic therapy. You can see axial shallowing, flat antechamber. With the treatment, how beautifully the antechamber has formed and things have got stabilized. Coming to the hyoidotomy, because the vitreous becomes uh, impermeable and with, there is a need to disrupt the anterior hyoid phase. If you want to do the ag hyoidotomy, what is required is the clear view is very essential. Usually, when you do the YAG laser anti-hyloidotomy, you have to wait at least for 20, uh, 24 hours for the effect to happen. And uh, if the eye is pseudophagic or apagic with the post capsule, capsulotomy also is needed along with the anti-hyloidotomy to establish a communication between the posterior segment and the anti-segment. And this is an eye which had a misdirection, had a large PA with the pseudophagia. And following the capsulotomy and the hyloidotomy, patient responded well to the therapy. And uh, on you, uh, yes, can uh, um, biometry, you can see um, this uh, yes, OCT, you can see a good communication between the posterior chamber and the antechamber because of the hyloidotomy, there is some amount of which is prolapse into the antechamber also. And this has restored the normalcy, and the antechamber has deepened with the treatment. The, coming to the vitreous surgery, the principle here is removal of the highlight barrier than the removal of the vitreous. You should make sure that you will remove the anterior highlight phase. That is, you have to break the anterior highlight phase and also establish a communication between the posterior chamber and, and the antechamber. Basically, you are making a, a eye into a single chamber to avoid uh, aqueous misdirection happening even with the time. The initial procedure was recommended by Chandler's operation and uh, it can be done by anti-segment surgeon, but with the technology what we have today and uh, nobody does the uh, blind Chandler's operation, most of the times it is the pars planar vitrectomy. And this is one of my colleagues who has uh, helped me to do the surgery here and it is a pseudopicia in an angle closure eye where the picoival trap has done, she developed uh, um, aqueous misdirection. You can see that uh, after the uh, vitrectomy and uh, what um, is done here is, I will just forward it. And you can see creating a, a opening in the iris and removing the capsule and establishing a communication between the posterior chamber and the antechamber. So you are converting the eye into a a single chamber. Unless you do this step, the relapse of the aqueous misdirection is likely to happen. So whenever you deal with a surgery like this, this has to be done. And it becomes easy to do this in a, a pseudophagic eye. In a phagic eye, majority of the times we do do the cataract also along with it. With it, If you are not in favor of doing the removing the lens, then at least we should break the anti-highlight phase. That is very critical and uh, make sure that the PA is patent in such a situation. You can see here how the chamber is connected with the anterior chamber. 
and uh, coming to the other eye management the man once it happens in one eye the chances of it happening in the other eye is very high if there is angle narrow angle acquire to be done whenever there is surgical intervention is needed in the other eye we have to make sure that we take all the precautions to avoid any sudden shallowing of the ante chamber so you have to form the chamber well on the table post operatively laser suture lysis or uh, releasable sutures has to be handled very carefully and these eyes have to be kept on cycloplegic for longer period of time so this is in brief about the aqueous misdirection the second thing chitra has already covered i will just go through the uh, the second complication that we can see with the trabeculectomy that is blebitis and bleb related and ophthalmitis what are the risk factors for it trabeculectomy at the inferior site has a higher chance use of the antimetabolites has resulted in thin cystic blebs so the uh, risk has increased and in the past people used to do full thickness procedures for better control of the iop and those eyes are at a higher risk to develop uh, infection and you you can classify them into mild moderate and severe what is mild bleb infection but no ante chamber or vicious involvement is called mild moderate bleb infection with ante chamber inflammation but no vicious involvement severe is bleb infection with ante chamber and the vicious involvement so how do we manage this is just the blebitis without ante chamber involvement and it is a ophthalmic emergency take the conjunctival swab start the intensive topical treatment and carefully monitor the patient you need not admit the patient but you have to monitor almost twice a day if needed uh, till things subside the moderate one we do admit the patient it is an ophthalmic emergency and uh, usual the conjunctival swab will be taken along with it uh, topical we give even the systemic drops and very careful monitoring is needed the severe grade we take the vitreoretinal lens surgeon help also here admission with the topical and systemic antibiotics close monitoring we may have to take a uh, ac tap to culture uh, to send it for the culture intravitreal antibiotics are ne needed Dep if it is very severe a diagnostic and therapeutic vitrectomy also is mandatory and this is a blebitis with resolving with the topical medication the fifth day of the treatment and it has cleared totally with the time the only problem is whenever the blebitis resolves there is a possibility the blood can fail so you have to keep a close watch on the intraocular pressure uh, how do we prevent patient education to tell the patient unnecessarily not to touch the eyes not to rub the eyes any conjunctivitis to see a doctor immediately and uh, if they should not uh, use the contact lenses i tell all my patients not to swim because you can never be sure how the swimming pools are maintained there are some people who believe in giving a topical antibiotic at the start of the symptoms to the patient they caution the patient ask them to keep an antibiotic ready in hand as and when needed to start up the medication usually we don't do that we ask them to consult with doctor as as soon as possible uh chitra has already covered about the blood leak uh, i think i will just quickly look at the this are the two types one is um, a localized leak and the diffuse leak and uh, it, we used to see a lot of uh, blebs like this because of the limbal based flap because limbal based flaps gives localized thin cystic blebs with a steel ring around it whenever the uh, uh, bleb increases in size suddenly it gives way nowadays with the modifications in the surgical techniques where fornix based is uh, done more often and with a aim to obtain a more posterior diffuse blebs we don't see this kind of blebs anymore so it is a small video where i am using for a localized leak a autologous blood injection after cleaning the anterior cubital fossa with a cubical and syringe patient's uh, blood will be withdrawn and using a 27 gauge or 30 gauge needle away from the bleb uh the needle will be inserted into the center of the blood where the like the likely leak is and then inj inject the blood and this blood will basically will block the leak and can result in closure of the leak it works well only when there is a localized leak when you have a late leak with a diffuse leak like here this may not work then in such a situation you may have to go for what we call it as a blebexition you have to excise the entire bleb 
and take a conjunctival autograft, usually from the inferior quadrant. So after excising the blood, if, the, if the, there is necrosis of the sclera, you may have to reinforce the sclera, either with the partial thickness flap from adjacent to it or the donor sclera. And uh, undermine the conjunctiva well and take a little larger than the what uh, uh, you have dissected superiorly, the conjunctiva uh, uh, autograft from the inferior quadrant, place it limbus corresponding to the limbus and using a 10 bone nylon sutures, you close it tightly. And one advantage of with this is your blood function will not get compromised. This is how you manage a, a large leak because of the uh, late leak due to the trabeculectomy. So these are the three complications I thought can I can share with you all in detail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vijaya. Uh, Dr. George, maybe just a question because we are running late. Yeah. Uh, Vijaya, ma'am, just one question. Do you have yes. any, any guidelines for use of atropine, any strong cycloplegics like atropine for short eyes, mm -hmm. post trabeculectomy? There is no shallow AC, but do you continue these patients on okay. prolonged on yeah. atropine? Uh, I think the use of atropine, again, I think within country, it widely varies because yesterday me and Sirisha had one uh, webinar with the uh, Bangladesh Glaucoma Society. And she seems to be using uh, atropine in all eyes, but we tend to use uh, atropine nowadays. We I don't use it in general glaucomas and primary open angle glaucomas or combined surgeries. But definitely, I use it for angle closure eyes. I start from the table. Immediately after the trabeculectomy, I put them on uh, atropine. Minimum period of two weeks is what I use it. And I monitor it carefully. If there are no problems in the postoperative period, like shallowing of the anterior chamber, I tend to uh, disc uh, discontinue it after two weeks of time. But Definitely in all angle closure eyes, I start using 1% atropine eye drops twice a day from the day of surgery. One tiny question I have, Dr. Vijay. How long after trap would you still think of doing needle revision or needling when we would say that beyond this point, needling will not help? Okay, needling is, uh, in my practice, the needling of the blood, I do it at a much, much later stage, not in the immediate post-operative period. Maybe it may be at least three months. And I have done it even after two years and two and a half years. If there is a reason to believe that the stoma is patent, the fibrosis is the only cause for, for the failure. So here, when I do the needling, I, I tend to use the mitomycin C and needling of the blood. Thank you. You will have to stop sharing your screen, Dr. Vijaya. Thank I you very much. We will come back to you with more questions uh, at the end of the thing. Uh, we shall now go on to our debate. Uh, a debate about would I do a primary tube trap or a primary tube? So the primary trap, Dr. Satyan would be talking. And primary tube, Dr. Kavita. I have already introduced Dr. Satin. I just briefly introduced Dr. Kavita. Dr. Kavita is the head of Glockma Services at Arbindai Hospital from Pondicherry. Is another young lady with a very distinguished career, awards, and publications. She's also been a key investigator of a landmark trial on angle closure and a lot more happenings in her career and growth. So she is going to be debating on tubes. I do believe this is going to be an interesting debate, and let's hear the two of them. On to you, Dr. Satyan. Dr. Satyan, you are muted. Hello? Hello, Dr. Satyan? Dr. Satyan's audio is not connected. If you have a tube first, then yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Satyan is not connected. Okay. Dr. Satyan's audio is not connected. He's now connected. He, he can speak. Yeah. Dr. Satyan. Dr. Satyan is connected. He tried screen sharing in the beginning itself. I don't know what has happened. He is not responding. 
Can you can you can we hear Doctor? There is a bandwidth issue at Doctor Satyan's end. We are getting a distorted voice. Shows the both are uh, both video and audio both are on. But there is there is a disturbance in the audio. Maybe I think maybe we could ask him to connect on his uh, use the Bluetooth from his phone to get connected. In the interim, we could ask Doctor Kavita or Doctor Satyan is connecting. I think. Dr. Satyan, if you have me. Can you increase your volume? We can do the other presentation first, ma'am. Yes, I think so. Uh, while uh, Dr. Satyan is getting sorted out, Dr. Kavita, uh, maybe we will uh, ask. Yes, yes, madam, I can do, but I think he has to stop sharing. Ah, oh, yeah. Stop sharing his screen. Uh, I'm trying to stop. I'm trying to stop. Can you slides? Please stop now. Please stop. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, good evening, one and all. And like, uh, I think uh, I will be putting my points in favor of primary two after uh, the complications and presentations from Vijaya Madam and Chitra Madam. I think now Dr. Satyan is backing up and he's thinking to talk uh, whether to talk or not in favor of. <laughs> so I will I will now proceed with my views. So as we all know, trabeculectomy, if we look back, it started back in 1968. And now it remains the king of glaucoma surgery, the so-called the gold standard glaucoma surgery. So is it without any trouble? I think a lot have been described. And now I'll put few points uh, showing the downsides of trabeculectomy. It is associated with serious complications, some of which can compromise the vision also doesn't work in all types of glaucoma and post-operative interventions. It was very well covered by all the previous speakers, the need of digital massage, follow-up, post-operative steroids, and so on. And again, all these uh, difficult glaucomas with advanced uh, damage and when there is a macular split, there is a chance of visual loss and the patient can get a vision loss also. So let's look at the data. This is the data from US Medicare beneficiaries. This is from Dr. Pradeep Ramalu. This shows a downward trend of trabeculectomy starting from the year 1994 till date. We can see clearly from 1994 to 2003, they said almost it is a 52% drop. And 2002 to 2012, it was another 52% drop. This is the scenario of trabeculectomy in the Western world. Let's look at the glaucoma drainage devices. They have shown success in controlling intraocular pressure. Though previously they were reserved for refractory glaucomas, now of late it is becoming more popular and looked upon as an alternative to trabeculectomy. It's just a sentence. Shall we look at the evidence? The tube versus trabeculectomy study. We have the results of one year, three years, and five years, which compared trabeculectomy against a barbell glaucoma implant and eyes which had previous intervention in the form of a cataract surgery or a failed trabeculectomy. So what did they find? It is more efficacious to implant a glaucoma drainage device to control intraocular pressure than to perform a repeat trabeculectomy on patients who had previous intraocular surgery, especially those who underwent trabeculectomy. So if this is the case in eyes which had a previous intervention, does it have a role to play as a primary procedure? Yes. For that also, we have evidence. The primary tube versus trabeculectomy study, where we have the results of one year and three years out. It's a multicenter randomized trial involving 242 patients, 125 in the barbell group and 117 in the trap group in the age group 18 to 85 years. 
in intraocular pressure more than 18 and less than 40 with maximum medical therapy majority of the patients were poag and the primary outcome measure was the rate of surgical failure in these eyes let's look at the results as we see here, though there is a significant difference in the reduction of intraocular pressure in the trap group as compared to the tube group, if you look at the tube group, it's not doing really bad. 64% of the patients had an intraocular pressure less than 14 millimeters of mercury as shown here. And again, the same holds good at three years also. So let's look at the primary surgical outcome, which is the probability of the surgical failure. The cumulative probability of the surgical failure was 28% in the trap group and 33% in the tube group, and it was not statistically significant. So coming to the surgical complications, the early postoperative complications, late postoperative complications, and serious complication. That means which require a surgery to manage the complication or the one which produced more than two Snellen lines of vision loss was more common in the trabeculectomy group than in the tube group as shown here. So what were the other observations? When the first year result was out, the cumulative probability of failure was higher in the tube group, which was statistically significant as compared to the trap group. But as with the long-term follow-up, the failure rates were no longer significant at three years, as we see here. So we have to wait and watch for the five years result to decide on a trap or a tube in these eyes as a primary procedure. Also, from first year to third year, we can see a progressive increase in the number of anti-glaucoma medications in the trap, whereas in the tube group, it was fairly constant. Hypotony with vision loss was more common with the trap and trap had higher overall complications. So was it only with the BGA? What happened with the Ahmed one? For that also we have evidence. Wilson et al. did a study comparing Ahmed glaucoma valve and trabeculectomy in 123 patients and they observed no statistically significant differences at about three and a half years between these two groups among various outcomes. So they concluded Lower intraocular pressures were noted for trabeculectomy during the first year. With long-term follow-up, the intraocular pressure and the cumulative probabilities of success were comparable between these two groups. Now, people might argue tubes are costlier. Is cost really a barrier? Let's see. We know barbell glaucoma implant is not available in India and it is too costly for us to afford also. And AGV is available in the cost of 18,000 INR. Now we have the prototype of barbell implant, Adi, which most of us are already using. It is available in the cost of 50 US dollars, which has the potential to break the cost barrier. Now, whenever a new device is into the market, and it is also available in the low cost, we will have a question about its safety and efficacy. Let's look at the evidence for RD. So it has shown the intermediate term outcomes have shown good results with RD, not only in adult eyes, but excellent results in pediatric refractory glaucomas. Also, it has been compared with the Ahmed glaucoma valve, where it has shown good results at six months. And one of the study by Patekre et al. has shown RD group as compared to the AGV group required lesser number of anti-glaucoma medications and had significantly higher success rate. So now people might argue, I don't have access to patch graft and how can I go about pubes? For that also, we have results from one of our panelists, Dr. Josh, with the recent publication, which has been out in American Journal of Ophthalmology which has compared patients with patch graft and without patch graft by doing a long tunnel, and they have proved both are equally safe and effective. Hence, the advantages of the tube trap result more consistent, the blood is more posteriorly located, lesser postoperative results, lesser postoperative interventions, and less risk of blood-related endophthalmitis. And hence, we have to conclude that both tube shunt surgery and trabeculectomy are very effective in lowering intraocular pressure, where we can lower the intraocular pressure to the lower teeth in tubes, not only in traps, and difference in failure rate at this point of time in the primary trap versus tube study is not statistically significant. However, side threatening complications are more common with trabeculectomy as compared to the tube surgery. This is again the same study which I shared earlier showing the downtrend of the uh, traps. Here we can see this is the condition in the Western world where the tube surgery has steeply increased from 1994 to 20. 
when this is the situation in the Western world, our days to see this is not so far off. And hence, the time has come to coronate the new king, the glaucoma drainage devices, which is, will be a new gold standard. Thank you. That was a, a wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Kavita. Is Satyan there to fight for the trap? Dr. Satyan? Could you share yeah, your screen? Yeah. yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Can you see the screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Is my audio okay now? Yes, very good. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kavita, for uh, showing the trap. Tubes uh, uh, advantages, but I'll just share. Uh, so this is just a disclaimer. The image of the opponent and the RO lab are just dramatized only for the debate purposes and not for any other personal grounds. So this is my beautiful opponent with all the jewelries and I don't think any other space is left over for it to use any more jewelry, but still she managed to have one more from the auto lab. There's a BAS Mark one. you can see from the earrings. So this is the new device which she was just talking about. So what do you really expect when you do the glaucoma surgery? One is the intraocular pressure control. Then of course, the long-term outcomes is very essential to understand how it really works. And the ease of doing surgery is extremely important. The learning curve is again important. Just looking at the other things, she was just talking about the US economy, but what we need is the Indian economy, how it is really. So, and then looking at the repeatability of the procedure is extremely important. Looking at the number of publications, there are uh, infinite number of publications from the TRAP group. And then of course, once you see the tube group, only there are two publications comparing the primary tube versus the primary TRAP. And I think all of us know that how many of us really do as a primary tubes in our uh, surgeries. So as Kavita was mentioning about, I'm also going to talk about the same uh, primary tube versus TRAP uh, surgery at the end of uh, one year and three years. And there is another one more study in the Acta Ophthalmologica, which is comparing the bevel with a trap that is at the end of five years. This is in fact a refractory glaucoma study. So just look at the IOP drop, those she was mentioning about the comparisons. At the end of one month, of course, we don't expect much of a difference in the IOP drop in the tube group, but the trap is obviously is much better at the end of one month. And of course, you see at six months again, there's a significant difference of about close to two millimeters. And also at the end of one year, there is another uh, two, uh, around 1.5 to two millimeters close to that. And at the end of three years, again, you can see close to two millimeters of difference. We all know that every millimeter matters a lot, especially when you have advanced glaucomas, every millimeter makes a change of 10% risk reduction. Just looking at the PTVT study at the end of three years, there is a change at least about a close to two millimeters difference. That is very important for us to understand. This is the other study which I showed as the act of thalmologic at the end of five years. We can see that the intraocular pressure control is almost same in both the groups, in fact, the survival rate as well. But just look at this data, how many AGMs the patient really requires at the end of the five years. There's a significant difference in the requirement of AGM in the, uh, in the bevel group. There's about close to 1.5 to 2, uh, 2 medications is the additional requirement which we really uh, need to uh, put the patient on. Looking at the post-operative interventions, there is no significant difference between the two groups, the tube versus trap study. But as Kavisa was mentioning about the serious complications, I'm not sure what kind of a surgeons uh, was involved in the other group. How many of us have really had seen that so much of complication in, in our own context. I don't think we have so much of complications, but in fact, we have seen more complications with the tube in reality. Though this is a very well matched study in US group, but in Indian scenario, I don't think we have so much complications in trap in comparison to the tube. So just look at the ease of doing surgery and the learning curve. 
it takes about 15 minutes to do the 15 to 20 minutes to do the trap surgery versus 60 minutes close to one hour if you have five cases in a day you are you are almost dead you cannot go to the op and see any more patients in your opd so the whole day is over for you with three or four cases and even in experienced hands there is a very very steep learning curve when you want to do the uh, tube surgeries looking at the economics for the patient probably for kavita a spine she can have more jewelries in her but looking at the patient's uh, perspective at least two to three times the more cost per surgery and if you want to really repeat the procedure i don't think you can do uh, two or three in a uh, in a uh, tube surgeries of course in, uh, in traps at least you can do minimum of two repeat procedures uh, i don't think this is really a judgment day it has already been decided there is no need to go and do such a complicated procedure as a primary procedure and i am sure the kavita will change to much more simpler much more beautiful <laughs> than having all the jewelries simple surgery simple very useful outcomes there's not much of a complications i think i would look at going in for the primary trap than for the tubes thank you so much thank you very much dr sathi uh, i mean uh, you spoke so well gave us a good punch so what does dr george have to say in this debate to both of them dr george dr chitra yeah i don't think george will be a good judge in this matter i i think so yeah yeah we will ask somebody else maybe dr vijaya madam i trust her yes the yes. judge will be different from george <laughs> people there was no need for him to be quiet they have listened <laughs> I, i always um, i mean if, if the Uh, this uh, webinar is intended for the postgraduates and youngsters <laughs> i think that we have a onus on us to make it clear to them because they should not get carried away by either of the procedures i strongly believe both have a role okay and uh, uh, where do you do the tube as a primary yes like vinay has mentioned there are certain clinical situations where tube will definitely do well then the trap but in the present indian scenario for a primary open angle glaucoma if somebody comes to the clinic that needs a good control of the pressure a fakey kai i deal i still do a trabeculectomy not the tube Thank but it's a pseudo fakey kai which comes to the clinic with the high intraocular pressure i do consider it tube rather than a trabeculectomy yeah you you just consider but you don't do it i do <laughs> depends upon so many other factors when it was if it sachin has done the cataract surgery where you the conjunctiva remains untouched he would not even touch the conjunctiva then maybe i will do the trabeculectomy yeah chair ma'am one question i have yes. a, a primary open angle glaucoma fakey patient comes to you with a failed trabeculectomy would you do a repeat trabeculectomy with mitomycin or would you put in a tube yeah uh, uh, i think i will look at the what is the age of the patient what is the extent of the damage to the optic disc and what is the visual field like suppose if somebody has a advanced damage i think if the conjunctiva is fairly mobile if there is a good possibility that trabeculectomy can be successful one i do consider trabeculectomy for the simple reason patient can be most of the times at least most of the times can be off the medication and you can achieve low pressures which is needed so both procedures have a role in management of glaucoma thank you Thank you very much. Both the speakers did a great job yes. and talking yes. smiles to all our faces. So, a uh, little bit. Kavita asked uh, Sachin to give you that photograph. I don't think. Yes, you are. I don't know. Not the photograph. She looks more beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I'll send her the photograph. Yeah. So we shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Sirisha. Dr. Sirisha, could you share your screen? Dr. Yes. Sirisha Sendal is the head of Glaucoma Services at LB Prasad Eye Institute from 2012 till date, and she specializes in managing ref refractive adult and pediatric glaucomas. And her areas of interest are glaucoma drainage implants and managing combined cataract and glaucoma. She is an investigator for several studies, has published over 117 scientific papers, and authored several book chapters, and has received innumerable Best Video Awards at GSI. many best papers at the major national and international conferences 
She's going to be talking on MIGS in glaucoma surgery, its relevance in the present day scenario. On to you, Dr. Sirisha. Yeah. All right. So can you hear me? Yes. A little louder if possible. Yeah. So I will add to the confusion that Kavita and Satyan started. And Kavita beautifully showed the picture where uh, Biggs is a small baby standing in the corner. Beware, maybe in a couple of years, it will try and uh, fight to occupy the central chair. So if you look at the glaucoma management, the paradigm of treatment is most of the glaucomas are treated medically, close to about 90%. And then in certain situations, we do use lasers. And uh, once that fails or when you read better pressure control, we do go in for uh, surgeries. And surgeries most often that we use at trab and tube. That is what we just heard. Definitely the mitomycin C has improved the success rates. And looking at the complications that Kavita and uh, Satyan showed for each other, uh, against each other, we know that both have problems. So we know that... Uh, as time goes by, bleb-related surgeries do have a lot of complications related to the blebs, and tubes are no far away. It's apart from the intraocular pressure that you're worried about, you do have a, a huge uh, implant sitting in there, and that can cause a lot of problems, whether inside the eye or outside the eye. So the question that occurs to us is, can we avoid these complications? And what do we do to avoid these complications? Do we modify our glaucoma filtering surgeries, or do we have alternative surgical options? So the topic uh, that is the MIGS is otherwise called as minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. There's nothing minimally invasive. So maybe you will put it as micro-invasive glaucoma surgery. What does this uh, do and what, what are we looking at? What we are trying to see is can we improve the physiological outflow of the aqueous through the trabecular Schlem's canal and the collector channel pathway where you can do a procedure with no blip and possibly no bleb related or hypotony related problems because you don't want too much of a pressure control. And majority of these surgeries can also combine with cataract surgery. So you're looking at better safety profile and also looking at moderate intraocular pressure control. There are multiple uh, mix procedures that are available. They are majorly divided into ab external and ab internal procedures and several of them that uh, are actually uh, being used in the West is uh, our ab internal procedures. So what are these procedures? And for easy understanding, because we don't do several of them in our country because they are not available in our country and the cost is a huge factor. But to understand what are these mixed procedures, basically, if you look at the drainage of the aqueous, aqueous, after it is getting produced, it drains through the trabecular meshwork, from the trabecular meshwork goes to the Schlem's canal, from the Schlem's canal to the collector channels and the intrascleral uh, the plexus and the aqueous veins and that is how it moves out. So you are targeting every one of these uh, areas, that is the Schlem's canal opening as well as the trabecular meshwork. In open angle glaucoma, we know that the problem is at the, at the trabecular meshwork. There is a resistance that is offered at the trabecular meshwork. So you're trying to uh, use procedures that can bypass this trabecular uh, resistance. And once you do that and reach the Schlem's canal, apparently, if everything else is okay uh, in the aqueous pathway, the uh, intraocular pressure is likely to control. And uh, there are alternate pathways like the suprachoroidal pathways where you know that in, let's say, in a complication like a cyclodialysis cleft, you do have significant decrease in intraocular pressure to an extent that it goes into hypotony. So can you try and do a controlled kind of a drainage into the suprachoroidal space where you have an alternate pathway to reduce the intraocular pressure? And of course, the subconjunctival procedures where you're trying to modify a non-conjunctival uh, touch kind of a procedure like the Zen or a minimally uh, invasive procedure like the in-focus. So these are all the ones that are available and there are several others that are there in the experimental stages and we don't have them yet available for us uh, after the clinical trials. So there's a huge list of things, and I will just take you through a few of them. And uh, like, like was mentioned, definitely there is a decreasing trend in trabeculectomies in the West, and the implants are slowly increasing or almost remaining stable, whereas the mixed procedures are increasing, and these mixed procedures are not just being done by glaucoma uh, surgeons, but in fact, most of them are being done by the cataract specialists and they are always combined with the cataract surgery. 
So it's also called as FACO plus. So what do you do here? Whenever you do a, a FACO emulsification, what they're trying to do is do a slight modification uh, of the procedure at the end of FACO emulsification, try and use one of these devices to try to bring down the intraocular pressure just by a little bit. And their major aim is to decrease the number of anti-glaucoma medications that the patient is using, not to completely stop the anti-glaucoma medications. And here you need to remember that a caveat here is that this is most often offered to patients where the pressures are under control on medications and patient is undergoing a procedure. So your intention is to bring down the number of medications, but not as an alternative to medications or an alternative to trabeculectomy or a tube. For mixed procedures, what is it that we need to know? So what we need to be aware of is definitely good anatomy and one needs to be uh, comfortable using a surgical gonio lens. So looking at the uh, uh, gonioscopic view of the angle during the surgery is very, very important. Identifying the structures is very important. And uh, to be able to use a direct gonio lens, so those of uh, who are pediatric surgeons who are using uh, these lenses to do a goniotomy or any other procedures may find it uh, easier, but even otherwise, it's not difficult to learn. So you have both direct as well as indirect lenses that are being used. For the direct lenses, you definitely need to make the arrangements of the uh, uh, scope adjustments and things like that to be able to visualize the angle. And for certain indirect lenses, we can uh, try and do it even in a primary position. Identifying the Schlem's canal uh, or the area of the trabecular meshwork is very, very important. And uh, uh, one of the tips is that if you are able to uh, uh, see the blood in the Schlem's canal, that will give you a definite identification of, and it's a marker for you to know that this is the area of the Schlem's canal and you will be able to uh, do the procedure uh, appropriately. Other con consideration that one needs to have while doing or considering mixed procedures is that one should know th uh, that the Schlem's canal that is present as a 360 degree around uh, the limbus is not a continuous channel. There are certain breaks in the Schlem's canal and these collected channels may not be present all over and they may be present in certain segments. So whenever you look at MIGS, in fact, when there was a, a clinical trial that we were supposed to do many, many years ago with the eye stent, uh, the trial design itself was with two eye stents versus, uh, in, with phaco, phaco emulsification versus simple phaco emulsification. So at that time, we were not aware as to why people were using two eye stents. So one of the reasons why uh, what they had quoted and that we understand now is that we do not know when we use a single eye stent whether we are very close to these collector channels. So although we bypass the trabecular meshwork and let the fluid reach the Schlem's canal, is this going to get out of the Schlem's canal in a proper way? So that is a question that is always there. So uh, what we understand is that the infronasal area has maximum collector channels and that is the area that is targeted and that is also because when you sit naturally and when you try to do the procedure, it's easier to target the nasal area. And uh, that is something that we need to understand. So the ice, uh, the ice tent is one of the things that has been there for a very long time. This is a one millimeter long tube, uh, which, which is a titanium device, which is used to, if you look at the picture here, this is the angle view. Uh, you see the snorkel like thing where the tube, where the opening is into the anterior chamber and the uh, stem is inserted into the Schlem's canal. And this is placed in, in, in position there. And there are two, two of these are inserted to be able to drain the fluid by bypassing the trabecular meshwork. And if you look at this uh, slide here, they have gone through a huge number of iterations. And there are several new generations that are coming up, uh, starting from 2012 onwards. And uh, new ones are there in the market. Ice tent, ice tent inject, ice tent supra. And now you have ice tent infill. The other device that is available uh, for uh, bypass of the Schlem's canal is the hydrus implant, which is a little larger one, and it almost occupies about three clock hours of the Schlem's canal. So it's made of a biocompatible material, which is highly elastic, which is called nitinol, and uh, it has a posterior opening and anteriorly there are three openings. So here also it is similar to that of the eye stent. You see that a tiny opening that is left in the anterior chamber, and the rest of it is placed in the Schlem's canal. It not only allows to reach the Schlem's canal, but because of its size and its location, it also tries to uh, uh, open up the Schlem's canal or enlarge the size of the Schlem's canal. The other group of surgeries which are uh, kind of being performed are possibly this are one. This is this is one group of surgeries which I think even in India we are doing. A few of us are uh, doing, and we have uh, access to these procedures. But uh, the other ones, I said, uh, these tents are quite expensive and they're not easily available in our country. 
what we do here is trying to open up. So the, the trabecular meshwork is what is kind trying to give the resistance, try to remove the trabecular meshwork. You can do that by either using a suture or a needle or a blade or using a micro pottery to be able to do that. So 360 uh, a trab or omini is uh, something that is ab interno procedure where you're using a proline suture to go and uh, uh, enter into the Schlems canal. You can So there are two types of techniques here. Either you can go and dilate the Schlems canal and come out, or you can dilate it and try to rip open the inner wall of the Schlems canal. So by doing so, you're trying to give access. So it's kind of a modified goniotomy, if you want to call it as. Ab interno uh, trabeculotomy or the trabectome is nothing but... Uh, doing the similar kind of a thing but using a high frequency electrocautery and uh, you are trying to ablate the inner wall of the Schlems canal uh, by doing so you are allowing the fluid to reach the uh, uh, Schlems canal uh, by uh, by ablating a portion of it. Kahook dual blade another is another uh, instrument that is available and this is something that at least we have some experience with uh, where this use it, this, it, it is a blade with a very sharp tip and it has the ramp which has the cutting edges so the sharp blade is trying to be uh, when you try to insert it into the area of the tr trabecular meshwork you're trying to actually do de-roof it by removing the uh, area of the trabecular meshwork so by uh, about uh, three to four clock hours or a little uh, larger than that is something that you can try and remove and this ramp is used not only to cut the area of the trabecular meshwork but also tries to collect that uh, torn trabecular meshwork and then that also can be uh, removed from out of the eye so I'll just share a uh, video here. Uh, this is again uh, combined with uh, phaco emulsification. So you do the phaco the way you normally do. At the end of the procedure, the eye eyeball is uh, filled with uh, viscoelastic. And if it is under topical, it's quite easy. You can ask the patient to actually look towards the nasal side. And if you're sitting temporarily through a temporal clear corneal incision, you can use a direct uh, gonio lens. It's a Schwann Jacob lens. And uh, you can uh, insert the uh, KDB blade through the main phaco incision itself. We're trying to look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the angle. So you can see tiny little iris processes there and intermittently you can actually see the blood in the Schlems canal. What is very important when you're trying to do this procedure is don't try and press this lens on the cornea. When you start seeing folds on the cornea, it becomes very, very difficult for you. So you once you insert the uh, blade inside the eye, you just have to place the lens over the eye. So that means the viscoelastic is actually trying to form a cushion between your lens and the, on the uh, cornea. You can see actually pieces of blood in the Schlems canal. That beautifully gives you the uh, area where you're supposed to insert. So you're trying to pierce with the tip and then try to uh, uh, remove a scroll of the trabecular meshwork. You can do this with multiple techniques by trying to ask the patient to look in different directions as well as by moving your uh, lens. The only problem with this is that little bit of, you can see the blood, in, uh, blood is uh, trying to come out. So that's the strip of the uh, trabecular meshwork that is tried, uh, that has come out. You can uh, go use a forceps to go in and try to remove that. So a little bit of bleeding intraoperatively does happen. And at the end of the surgery, we can try and uh, uh, clear the anterior ch uh, chamber of the blood. And maybe I'll... I'll um, So you can use an irrigation aspiration to try and remove it. So with the IA probe, I was trying to peel off the torn uh, trabecular meshwork uh, strip, but it was not, not easy to do so. Then I used a forceps to go and remove it. So it's a very simple procedure. Uh, Postoperatively, you continue the regular medications that you're continuing. So this is a forceps, micro forceps that is used to go and uh, strip off the, uh, the torn uh, trabecular meshwork. Okay, so for these are post-operative pictures. The, the good thing is that day one post-op, the eye is crystal clear. You may have microhyphema. Most often you may not even see that. And you can see the arrow pointing out here on a gonio picture where there's a cleft. But they, uh, and in our series, what we have seen is um, close to 88% of these eyes had more than one anti-glaucoma medication drop at six months. And that is the follow-up that we have, which is good. Uh, like I said, again, this is not a, a procedure that is done in patients who require a really good intraocular pressure control or somebody, even with medications, don't have a good pressure control. This is not something that is indicated. 
Suprachoroidal shunts are used. This is a CIPA stent, but uh, in August 2018, based on the COMPASS uh, trial, because of the low endothelial count over a five year follow up, this has been withdrawn from the market. Uh, there are other ab external procedures like the steg Stegman canal expander and the suprachoroidal gold shunt, but then again, these are something that uh, we don't have any experience with. Subconjunctival implant or the, uh, uh, the acquisis or the uh, Zen implant is something that is being used. Again, this is an ab internal one, a collagen de derived gelatin uh, which is uh, inserted into the subconjunctival space. In focus micro shunt, I think of all the ones that are available is very promising. Uh, it is a, a small arrowhead kind of a shape that is there, very tiny one. You can see this a picture on, on the finger. It has a tube which is inserted in the ante anterior chamber and it also has a very small outlet which is placed in the subsclerally in the subconjunctival space. So it also, so you can see a picture here. Uh, it, it causes a very, very controlled drainage of the aqueous apparently and you may have a very low lying bleb or maybe a diffuse kind of a conjunctival uh, um, elevation but uh, not actually a bleb that is formed. But then uh, we do have a very uh, limited experience and this is not available in India yet but that is quite promising. What do these mix actually help you uh, with? They do produce de decrease in intraocular pressure, but not a very great amount of decrease in intraocular pressure. What you need to look at is the number of medications. So the number of medications, the lower panel here tells you, upper panel is the pre-op medications and the lower one in red is the post-operative medications. So number of post-operative medications definitely have uh, come down in with all these devices. And this is again a result which shows uh, the change, the reduction in intraocular pressure again could be quite variable because several of these studies may not have actually washed off the patient on medication. with medications may also have uh, good control and post-operatively also you will not see a good drop. But if you look at the total number of medications, significant drop is something that is seen. Where it is not indicated, definitely not in angle closures, you have significant uh, synechial closure, not in advanced glaucomas where you want really good intraocular pressure control. Definitely not in progressive glaucomas or those eyes with uh, that require a lower target intraocular pressure. Or somebody who have allergy to anti-glaucoma medications, you actually want to take them off all the medications. So again, mix may not be indicated in these eyes. So they are safer. Definitely it helps to decrease the number of anti-glaucoma medications, can avoid touching the conjunctiva, can bring down the intraocular pressure to mid teens with no bleb and possibly no hypotony related problems and less complications. There are several mix that are available and definitely a lot more in progress. What do they have to offer us? Definitely have a great promise and increase use in the future, possibly. But one prohibitive thing is the cost that is involved. Uh, and most of them are combined with cataract surgery. How much intraocular pressure does it reduce? For how long is a question for which we do not have answers as of now. But yes, uh, as time goes, we will have better evidence. But the biggest problem, like I told you, and I would like to re-emphasize is affordability. Affordability is a huge problem. So for that, just a little bit decrease in intraocular pressure of one uh, uh, and decrease in the number of anti-glaucoma medications. Do you, do you or can you afford to uh, provide this procedure at that cost is something that we will have to worry about. But yes, it definitely has a role in certain patients and availability is a question. Thank you for your uh, kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Srisha, for a very ex extensive talk. Uh, paucity of time, uh, Dr. George, I would go on to our next speaker and then we'll take the questions. Our next speaker is Dr. You Mehta. should ask Tanuj to comment about it. Tanuj has done a beautiful debate about it in the past. So he, he, he will be the right person to comment about uh, mix in India scenario. Thank you. Dr. Tanuj? So I think currently, I would not say mix this for India because you have these thousand dollar devices and the IOP lowering is very mild. So if you have a glaucoma patient, you require target IOP at least less than 18 or 15 with these canal, the canal devices, you cannot achieve that. Number two, now you have reports of late onset hyphema with all these GAT and the surgeries which open up the SLAMS canal. That is a very serious complication that is occurring years after surgery. And finally, the full thickness procedure, the Zen implant, and it uses a localized injection of mitomycin C. So you have 
all the late complications of mitomycin C like bilobitis, endophthalmitis occurring with the Zen implant. So I think currently these implants are still in evolution. There is no point in making the patient pay for these surgeries when you are just lowering the intraocular pressure or getting the patient off one medication. So currently I don't think it is for the Indian scenario. We have to wait and watch and the cost has to come down. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. George, I'll go on to the next speaker. Do you have any sure, other questions? Sure, sure. No, nothing. Uh, nothing at the all. next speaker is Dr. Sunita Dubey, who is the head of Glaucoma Services and Medical Superintendent, Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital, and uh, has, is a very proficient surgeon in the management of the entire spectrum of glaucoma and has more than 100 publications and book chapters. She's also been a past treasurer of Glaucoma Society of India. And one impressive award, besides innumerable awards which she's got, is the Woman Achiever Award as a role model in health category by the Business Rankers Magazine in 2017. Dr. Sunita, we shall be hearing on about the nuts and bolts of implanting a glaucoma drainage device and managing their complications. But I would be very obliged if you stick to your 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, so as we already know that uh, glaucoma drainage devices are the time-honored alternative and they have been the primary choice uh, for our most uh, complex glaucomas. And as we have heard, now they are in use increasingly even in primary glaucomas, although we are still not using them in India's primary surgery. However, it is important to assess the patient thoroughly before planning for GD. I think the most important um, and critical step is proper placement of tube uh, for the success of surgery and better long-term outcomes. And therefore, it is important to assess the extent of PAS and status of the lens, which are important determinants for the position of the tube, as you're going to place your tube depending on the extent of PAS and the status of the lens. Also, the management of primary pathology is crucial for prevention of post-operative complications. So you need to first manage the primary pathology. There should not be any vitreous um, uh, silicon oil or high femine the anterior chamber can block the tube. So I'll just uh, take you through uh, this uh, uh, surgery of AGV implantation. And it's very important to have a proper exposure of the surgical site. You can use uh, either superior rectus suture or corneal traction suture, or sometimes you have to use both the sutures if in a uh, deep set sunken eyes. Uh, two to three uh, clock hours periotomy with a radial relaxing incision is given to expose the uh, site properly with proper pottery. And um, it is important to measure the distance because you're going to fix the plate nine to 10 millimeter away from the limbus. And the priming of the, uh, the tube is very, very important. And uh, it's important uh, to check the patency of the tube. And this is the AGV and it has to, uh, it is now put into this pocket nine or 10 millimeter away from the limbus. I use just one nino nylon suture to fix the plate, the tube and the patch craft. And this is a mattress suture on both sides. And now the most critical step is the, the insertion of the tube. So you have to decide beforehand whether you're going to implant the tube or insert the tube in the anterior chamber or sulcus. Since this is a pseudophagic patient with deep anterior chamber, no PAS, I made this scleral trench so that the tube can be fixed deeper into the scleral bed. And uh, now you have to cut the tube with bevel up so that two to three millimeter of it goes inside the anterior chamber. And then it's inserted with this 23 gauge needle. And uh, it's very important to. Uh, fixation of the tube with this mattress suture, nino nylon again, uh, so that the tube um, lies flat onto the sclera and it doesn't have that friction effect onto the, uh, the overlying sclera or the patch craft. So it's very, very important to fix the tube like this. And finally, the scleral patch craft. So you can have a corneal patch craft or scleral patch craft. And uh, again, uh, I use this mattress suture to... Um, the scleral patch graft over the tube. 
and finally uh, the uh, conjunctival uh, suturing you can even uh, insert the tube uh, in the pars plana and uh, generally you do it in very complex cases along with the retina uh, surgeon and here the retina surgeon has already made a port and you can just introduce the tube uh, through the uh, the port irrigation port and make sure that your tube is visible uh, through the uh, through the pupillary area post operatively so post operative management is more or less same as we discussed about the trabeculectomy however one should remember that a bleb can undergo a hypotensive phase a hypertensive phase and finally a stable phase so hypotensive phase um, in uh, non valve implant is mainly because of the peritubal leakage or incomplete occlusion and in the valve implant it could be because of the malfunctioning of valve implants and therefore it is important to uh, the uh, to check the fitness of the tube or it there can be other related reasons it is more common uh, in eyes with thin sclera so one should be very careful the management to begin with is conservative however uh, later on, uh, the, the tube is touching the cornea or the lens it has to be dealt with uh, surgically hypertensive phase is very common in valve implants and it could be early or late and it it uh, said to be because of the exposure of conjunctiva and tenens capsule to the aqueous with pro inflammatory cytokines and therefore it has been suggested now that one can use uh, uh, aqueous suppressants at the uh, at very early stage and uh, most of these uh, 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 hypertensive phase uh, gets resolved with conservative approach however if uh, uh, the bleb becomes encapsulated one has to resort to needling or removal of the uh, the bleb uh, wall now coming uh, to the complications uh, apart from the complications which we have heard for routine filtration surgery the the tube implants have very unique set of complications and they are related to the tube design and uh, the material and they are tube erosion conjunctival erosion implant exposure tube migration etc and uh, although they are rare they have to be managed properly so in the early post operative phase the tube end can get blocked by blood fibrin iris tissue lens material vitreous and it can be managed conservatively or a very simple procedure like yag Uh, yeah, uh, disruption of uh, this blood clot, which hap can happen in neovascular glaucoma, and you can see uh, by just uh, putting a little bit of energy, you can just uh, uh, dissolve this blood blood clot and uh, get a clear tube. And the vitreous, similarly vitreous, you can do it with yeah. Or if it is it is uh, too thick, uh, uh, if if it is too thick uh, strand, then uh, you have to resort to surgery. So. Uh, Uh, this particular patient required anterior vitrectomy now coming to tube erosion uh, it uh, uh, is again common in patients who have undergone multi multiple surgeries and it is because of the ex excessive tension overlying the tube poor tissue turgor or repeated mechanical force caused by eyelid and blinking so it is more common even in children and it could be because of the immune mediated inflammatory process or ischemic damage to the conjunctiva and it should be differentiated from wound dehiscence which occurs early in the course of the post operative period within one month and uh, uh, these uh, wound dehiscence can be resolved with conservative management and as we know doxycycline can be used um, with lubrication and lot of steroids because it has anti inflammatory activity and improvement in the ocular surface so one can resort to more conservative uh, approach in the beginning and uh, how to prevent tube erosion i think uh, already we have discussed uh, before that you can uh, use a long needle generated sterile tube tunnel entering 4 to 6 mm posterior to the limbus so this will prevent uh, this will uh, uh, create a track and prevent the tube from erosion and then uh, scleral trench suturing the tube covering the tube with a patch graft and etc etc so all, all these measures need to be um, adopted to prevent the tube erosion uh, once the tube has got eroded then you have to correct it conservatively and uh, just uh, you have to uh, inspect the conjunctiva if the conjunctiva is normal you can just undermine it put a patch graft and uh, uh, do a conjunctival advancement however if the conjunctiva is thin scarred scars or avascular owing to numerous previous surgical procedure you have to do a pedicle graft i'll just show a small clip here this is you can see this uh, tube erosion here patient was referred uh, by someone and 
you have to undermine the conjunctiva and um, the tube was slightly longer so you can just cut it and uh, reinsert it and fix the tube again fix the patch graft and you see there is some uh, you know uh, the conjunctiva uh, i am giving a relaxing incision because the conjunctiva fell short but you can just give this relaxing incision to um, uh, just um, so that the conjunctiva can uh, you can bring the conjunctiva forward and uh, you just have to give the incision in the uh, the conjunctiva and not on the tenens capsule and i have done uh, procedures like uh, several procedures and uh, like this and then you can bring the conjunctiva up fibrin glue can be used and also the amniotic membrane so i use uh, in such cases a lot of fibrin glue and amniotic membrane and which can uh, amniotic membrane as we know uh, can provide the basement membrane and stroma to restore conjunctival integrity and it is anti inflammatory also so in such cases it is very very effective however some of these procedures uh, some cases re do require uh, repeat surgeries and pedicle graft i'll um, in pedicle graft the rest of the procedures is same you have to measure the area of defect and then uh, dissect the pedicle graft from deep into the fornix and they rotate this flap onto the defect and uh, covering the defect so this uh, procedure is very helpful because this pedicle through this pedicle you are getting the vascularized conjunctiva so the blood supply uh, is uh, re established and therefore it is very important in patients who have recurrent tube erosions and uh, uh, otherwise because most of these patients uh, who have recurrent uh, tu uh, tube erosions the conjunctiva is necrosed and avascular and if you put a even pre uh, conjunctival graft it's not going to help so pedicle graft is effective this is the last video i am going to show is um, uh, the intraluminal uh, tube stent for delayed hypotony so delayed hypotony again is common in a few percentage of cases and this particular patient had multiple um, surgical procedures done two three failed pks and she had chronic hypotony um, occurring 7 8 months after tube implantation uh, so uh, two uh, corneal incisions are made uh, with side ports uh, viscoelastic is injected and this 40 proline suture was inserted into this tube to block it partially 40 uh, proline suture can't block it completely because the diameter of, tube of the suture is 150 microns and the inner diameter of the tube is around 300 so uh, it, is, it one can resort to 30 proline also but it is difficult to insert and the advantage of this procedure is that you don't have to open up the conjunctiva as you can see here this cleral patch graft is nicely placed and the conjunctiva is very uh, conjunctiva is very thin so if you try to open this you have to resort to more complex procedures so a simple procedure of stenting the tube may help in such uh, patients that if the pressure rises later uh, this can again be removed so uh, because of the uh, paucity of time i couldn't uh, cover other complications but to conclude meticulous surgical techniques follow ups and early recognition of complications are the key to improve success of glaucoma drainage devices thank you very much for your kind attention till and talk dr sunita uh, dr george would you have any question to ask where i would request dr sunita to start yeah. to share yeah ma'am i think we should just go on to vinay and ronnie yeah. because yes. we are already overshot the time and yes. so yeah. i would uh, while dr vinay shares his uh, slides he is a professor of the ophthalmology from all india institute and has special interest in congenital glaucoma in juvenile glaucoma has more than 170 indexed publications and has been actively involved in glaucoma genetics research and has received many special honors and awards we are really lucky to have you with us dr vinay and really look forward to uh, hearing your talk thank you dr, dr. vinay yeah i'm i'm there i hope you can see my slides no vinay i have done this screen sharing <clears throat> are the slides there and yeah, now it is yes, yes with it yeah okay so basically um, i'm going to talk about our uh, experience of 20 years and 
I have to cover this over the next 10 minutes, um, <clears throat> dealing with children with congenital glaucoma. So when you're dealing with um, these kids, you have to understand the anatomy of the eye, exactly what happens and why um, the congenital glaucoma develops. So normally the trabecular meshwork kind of slides posteriorly to open uh, the area which is then amenable for the aqueous to, out, uh, to flow out. But when this doesn't happen, then um, the iris and the uveal tissue are inserted much anteriorly and this then prevents the aqueous to kind of get obstructed. So if you look at a gonioscopy of these kids, you, what you see is that the, that the angle has a high iris insertion. And in some cases, there is an abnormal tissue that covers the angle. And this abnormal tissue is so thick that it is almost like a membrane. And that's why it needs to be cut in the form of a goniotomy. You can see how thick this iris tissue is. It's almost like a featureless angle in these patients. So when we did uh, a high definition anterior segment OCT in these eyes, we found that there is actually a very thick membrane occluding the aqueous outflow. And this happens uh, in a lot of these kids um, and, and, and prevents the, um, the aqueous outflow. And what also you can see is that there is no Schlem's canal. So these images are, are of very high definition ASOCT in children of congenital glaucoma. Here is a case of a unilateral congenital glaucoma and you can see the right eye, which is normal, has a normal rarefied trabecular meshwork and a Schlem's canal compared to let's say the left eye, which is affected and has an abnormal tissue at the angle and no Schlem's canal. So apart from an abnormal tissue at the angle, they also have a lack of Schlem's canal and this needs to be understood when you're managing these children because if you're doing just one procedure like a goniotomy or a, maybe a trabeculotomy, you're not taking care of the aqueous outflow channels totally, which in a lot of these cases, especially the ones that come to us are um, abnormal. So that means the abnormality that, that we see in our eyes, in our Indian um, children with pediatric glaucoma is more severe than what is seen in the Western um, countries. Another thing that you must understand is that the eye stretches. This eye stretches, the, the iris is thinned out, the ciliary bodies is splayed, the zonules are kind of kind of um, stretched out. And you can also see in some cases the anatomy is so abnormal that the ciliary body is kind of taking insertion from the iris. So when you're doing surgery in these eyes, and you must understand that if you try and go very posterior, you might hit the ciliary body and you might have a lot of bleeding or they might be vitreous. So therefore, whatever surgeries you do in these, in these children, you have to remain quite anterior so that you don't hit the vitreous or the ciliary body. So again, the clinical significance of understanding the anatomy is that you have to be as anterior as possible when you're doing your incisions and your excisions. Another important thing that you have to understand is that these kids come in varied form. You know, there'll be, there'll be children which have totally opacified corneas and there'll be yet there'll be those kids who have very large corneas but have got, which are clear. So then your decision making, your decision to operate depends upon what is the condition of the eye. If, if you cannot see any of the structures, like in this particular case, then probably you will just do a trabeculotomy with a trabeculectomy. On the contrary, in this particular child where you can see your angle and the glaucoma is not so severe, you, would, you could go get away with doing a goniotomy. But then you must understand whatever surgery you decide to do, you must understand that that has to be the best and the most appropriate option for you because you do not want to expose this child to multiple anesthesias. You do not want multiple surgeries, multiple EUA visits, and therefore all of the, 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 the problems that are associated with this, which are associated with the parents also. I can go on with, the, with showing you a, a video of a trabeculectomy with a trabeculotomy because this is important when people are doing it. And the important questions which a lot of ophthalmologists want to know is, whether to, do a, whether to do a limbal based trabeculectomy or a phonic based trabeculectomy in a child. In a very young child, less than two years, I would always do a limbal based surgery because a phonic based surgery in a child means a lot of sutures and these sutures will then have to be subsequently removed. And we do not want to do that because we want to avoid as many examination and anesthesia visits as possible. The other thing that you must understand is that the tenons capsule is extremely thick in these children. So because it is very thick, in some cases, some people like to do a tenotomy, tenectomy. 
Mitomycin use is important. I use mitomycin in almost all children primarily because the fibrosis is very quick and very fast. And therefore it is imperative that you use mitomycin for optimal success rates. Another thing when you're doing a, a, a trabeculectomy is that is different from adults is that because the sclera is very stretched out and thin, uh, these kids will have a very paper thin sclera. And therefore you do not, you have to be very careful when you are doing a, a, a scleral incision in, and, and when you're doing your scleral flap because it might just tear through and which could be a disaster um, uh, in managing the complications later on. So therefore, uh, when you're doing a, a, a scleral um, excision, you have to be very, uh, very sure that you're very gentle with the sclera and, um, and you make a large flap. You see, a large flap means that you are able to excise a large amount of trabecular, trabecular uh, meshwork. Because unlike adults here, one or two punches would not work. There is total dysgenesis 360 degrees and therefore you have to kind of excise also a large amount of um, trabecular uh, ostium. The, the rest of the surgeries is, is more or less the same. Since it's a trabeculotomy, you have to understand the anatomy again to, to be able to um, know your landmarks, where you have to make an incision to get your Schlem's canal. So some people like to tell the anesthetist to give a slight uh, pressure of the jugular vein so that you can get blood into the Schlem's canal. And that makes easy identification of the Schlem's canal possible. Um, but in most cases, once you're experienced, you can kind of get the Schlem's canal easily. We also tend to put the uh, mitomycin for some time under the scleral flap because in children, the sclera itself gets fibrosed very quickly. So it's important to have some antifibrotic under the scleral flap. So now we are, we are identifying where the Schlem's canal is. It's generally at the zone where the sclera meets the, the blue limbus. And, 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 and once you're experienced, you can actually find it very quickly. But in those eyes where the limbus is extremely stretched, it might be extremely very difficult to get the Schlem's canal. Now, for example, in this case, it was easy and you can see that there's a sudden gush of fluid and you're pretty sure that you are into the Schlem's canal. It's also important that you do your trabeculotomy with a good harms trabeculotomes. Getting access to a harms trabeculotome is also difficult because it's not, uh, not everybody makes it, but um, it has to be of adequate caliber and it should not be too thick or too thin. So this is a, the trabeculotomy being done on both the sides. It's important that you do not um, touch the uveal tissue because if you do that, then there will be a lot of pigment release. So you, when you see blood, then you, you're pretty sure that you are into the um, into the uh, um, uh, into the um, Schlem's canal, and this is on the other side. So the idea is that you're do actually doing two surgeries. You're doing a trabeculotomy with a trabeculectomy, which means that you are increasing the success rate. That means even if one of the surgeries fails in these kids, the other um, surgery takes over, and that. Um, gives a much longer term success rates compared to, let's say, doing a single surgery, like doing a, only a guniotomy or only a trabeculotomy. So a trabeculectomy with a trabeculotomy is, is, is the ideal, especially in those cases which have very advanced disease, those cases where um, the cornea would not give you access to, the, to do a guniotomy. Um, so I, as you can see, I've made a very large ostium in, the, in, the, in this child, primarily because... Um, the chances of failure are very high. So I'm not going into the, um, into the further surgery because of lack of time. The next important surgery in these uh, kids that you have to do is guniotomy. So this uh, guniotomy I've done under the intraoperative um, OCT and you can see that um, uh, there is a high insertion of the angle uh, of the iris, sorry, in this case, and you can see the abnormal tissue um, at, the, at, at the angle, which needs to be cut. As I said, goniotomy is to be primarily done in children who do not have an advanced stage of glaucoma where the cornea is clear and where you can get away with, with, um, um, with a surgery which might give a good long-term uh, uh, surgical success without having to create a bleb. So when you're doing a goniotomy, you can see the iris fall through back. As you can see in this case, um, a large amount of iris falls back. There is some amount of bleeding which you expect, but then the results are quite good if the, if, if the glaucoma is not advanced. So this is um, a case of goniotomy. You can get a little bit of blood. People have also described um, doing a 360 degrees trabeculotomy, which is circumferential. Um, the problem with this is that uh, you may not get access to 360 degrees all the time, which makes um, the failure rates pretty high. 
The results of surgery in children are miraculous. You can see how a, a, a hazy cornea completely clears up in a lot of these kids. This child was brought to me one year after surgery. I was shocked when the parents showed me how the child looked um, when he was born. And you can see the dramatic improvement and now the child is, is seeing well um, and, and is mobile. Another thing that is miraculous or dramatic that happens is the cup disc ratio. The cup disc ratio totally um, comes back to its normal si size, which um, uh, is very good in these children. And it's more important to document that this is happening. But what does not change is the harp stry. The harp stry do not come back, which means that they will stay there. They will cause some amount of photophobia and this has to be explained to the parents. In the post-surgical uh, uh, management of these kids, it's important to do examination under anesthesia every six months and monthly thereafter till the child is old enough for an OPD examination. This is especially when everything is okay. But when, um, when uh, the things are not well controlled, you may have to do the EUAs more often. And every EUA must be accompanied by doing a refraction and intraocular pressure and of course doing amblyopia therapy as, as quickly as possible. A refraction is important because once you've done surgery, there is a possibility that the eye, the axial length might change. It may decrease, it may increase, and this can be um, found out or monitored when you are doing subsequent refractions. So um, managing these kids is just not about um, uh, doing surgery, but it's also about managing the strabismus and myopia that ensues, as also in some cases you may require keratoplasty. Also, Something that is overlooked in these children is the fact that a retina evaluation needs to be done because if their axillins are long, then they will have a lot of um, chances of peripheral retinal degenerations and retinal detachments that also need to be looked into. We have recently published a 30 year experience of managing these kids um, and the visual outcomes that are associated with uh, kids who have congenital glaucomas. And, and what we saw was that a visual equity of 618 could not be achieved in more than about 30 to 35% of the cases. So almost um, 60 to 65% of the patients would have, or eyes would have visual acuity less than six by 18. And the reasons primarily for that is that amblyopia is not addressed. So amblyopia is a very important problem um, that precludes uh, their um, good vision and that has to be tackled as early as possible. Many of these kids would develop congenital, um, would develop cataract also because you've done surgery and at least about 10% of these congenital glaucoma is post-surgery, five years, 10 years down the line might develop cataract, which you may have to tackle. There are some of these kids who will not respond to one trabeculectomy, one surgery, another surgery may have to be done, a third surgery may be have to be done. I have, I restrict my glaucoma drainage devices in kids primarily because you do not know what this tube is going to do in these kids 10 years down the line. There is going to be problems with the endothelium and that has to be taken care of and therefore they have to be used as a last resort. Cyclodestructive procedures are, are good, but only temporary. They also give temporary relief and may have to be repeated multiple number of times to get adequate IOP control. So I can only summarize by saying that understanding the anatomy of, of, of these eyes is important when you're doing surgery. Um, it's for those who are not doing many of these surgeries, best is to refer to those centers where there are experienced surgeons who are dealing with these problems. And after all, whatever you have done, you must understand it will have a long-term consequence. It's important to make the parents understand, especially if they're coming from low socioeconomic status. So we have booklets for these kids, or for the parents of these kids so that they can understand what the disease is about. And that's very important um, when you are um, managing these kids. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Dine, for uh very detailed talk and so much information in 10-15 minutes. Um, we shall now go on to our very eminent speaker, Dr. Roni George, who is a research director of the organization and the deputy director of Glaucoma Services at Medical Research Firm Foundation. He's had the unique uh, uh, role of training over 60 Glaucoma fellows and a guide for PhD, DNB, and MPhil programs. He has published over 125 uh, uh, peer-reviewed indexed articles and is presently on the Education Committee of the Boyle Glaucoma Association and the editorial board of the Journal of Glaucoma, and also the section editor for the IGO, besides innumerable posts which he has held and has been a recipient of innumerable awards. He would be talking on managing refractive glaucoma and the role of micropulse transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, and we really look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Ronnie George. I think you're on mute, Doctor.
Ronnie, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Dr. Ronnie George. You are on mute. Admin can unmute him. Huh? Admin can unmute him. Admin? Mr. Sunil? Yes, ma'am. Could you unmute Dr. Ronnie George? He's unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Doctor. Sorry. So thank you, Dr. Chitra, and thanks to ARC for the invitation. So I'll basically start with just defining refractory glaucoma, which is defined as uncontrolled IOP with evidence of nerve or visual field deterioration, despite maximally tolerated topical and or systemic AGMs, failed surgical treatment, or a combination of surgery and medicines, or a high risk of failure of trabeculectomy. Some of these have already been covered in the uh, today, so I won't go into great detail. And these are the common refractory glaucomas that we come across. It's important to remember that when we treat these eyes, we have to think about visual prognosis. We have to look at the other associated conditions and consider the conjunctival status before we decide what to do. And these decisions are even more important when you look at one-eyed patients. If you have an eye with good visual prognosis, then aggressive management is the key. And we tend to avoid cyclodestructive procedures if you can. If you have an eye with a poor visual prognosis, then less aggressive management is what is uh, uh, then you can consider more aggressive management uh, like cyclobe destructive procedures. And the aims there are to basically keep the patient pain-free and uh, preserve cosmesis. If the patient is one-eyed, you would again try to avoid cyclobe destructive uh, procedures and try to preserve vision as best as you could. The options are medical, surgical, and the others. And I'm going to talk to you mostly about the others today. But when you look at medical management, there is a role for medical management in some situations. If you have somebody, let's say, with a chronic uveitic eye like this, where you get recurrent steroid responses and the IOP can be pretty high, it's a fairly badly scarred eye, fairly inflamed eye, you can try and cover an acute, acute IOP spike with systemic carbonic anhydride trace inhibitors if you're trying to see a downward trend of the steroid response. And if the disc is relatively healthy, you can probably wait a little while to do that. But if the situation is something like a high femur or somebody with a recent... Uh, corneal graft, where the risk of a graft failure or a corneal blood staining is high, you don't wait that long and you intervene earlier rather than later. Hmm? So when you look at surgical options, is a re repeat trabeculectomy an option? It is an option if the conjunctiva is mobile. Hmm? And also in an eye like this, which has had a previous trabeculectomy, where the previous trab has worked for three to five years, and there is space to do a second trab, you would consider doing a second trab provided your gonioscopy shows you that there is no high PAS in the superior angle, which would impact your surgical success. If the conjunctiva is not mobile, as in this eye, then you could consider putting in a uh, glaucoma drainage device superiorly. If the entire superior conjunctiva is uh, scarred, you could even try putting the glaucoma drainage device inferiorly. So these are all options that you would consider if, there is a, if you're trying to preserve vision to the best of our ability in these patients. But if you have something like this, which is an eye which has had multiple uh, procedures, you can even see a, a glued eye hole over there, a buckle, inflamed, stuck conjunctiva, you may have no options but to think in terms of cyclodestructive procedures. And cyclodestructive procedures aim to target the ciliary epithelium and reduce intro, uh, aqueous production. And typically we use cyclocryo or conventional diode laser photocorrelation. Both of these have the highest risk of thysis, which depending on the studies that you look at, would be anywhere between one to 3%. We also have the micropulse laser available to us, and we also have endoscopic cyclophotocorrelation as an option. In addition to the options, other options like a high intensity focus ultrasound. So when you compare the three diode procedures that are available to us, all of them use the similar laser, even though they have different consoles. The energy that you use is the highest for a conventional uh, diode cyclophotocorrelation, which is about 1500 to 3000 milliwatts. The endoscopic laser uses the least, and the micropulse uses something in between. The duration also differs because it is per spot for the conventional laser. And with the micropulse, you give it for about 100 to 200 seconds, depending on whether you're treating half or the uh, 360 degrees. The extent of treatment for both the conventional and micropulse is anywhere between six to 12 clock hours. In the endoscopic laser, you tend to be a little more conservative. You do only about three to six clock hours at most. And the area of the eye that you're treating is the fast plane eye for both conventional and the uh, endoscopic. 
for the microculture actually treating the past plicata and that's why the probe is a little larger and is placed a little further behind the limbus. So in a traditional di diode cyclophotoprogulation, you would use a G probe like that, which is placed at the limbus. And the, when you hear a pop sound after delivering the energy, you tend to reduce it a little bit because a pop sound is an indication of ciliary body destruction, which is not what you're trying to achieve there. And if you look at this UBM picture, you can see that the ciliary processes have become atrophic in the right, in the picture on the right, post diode CPC. And this is what can happen very often. And this is the reason why you are worried about thysis in these eyes. This recent uh, paper by uh, Harry Quigley, where they looked at 236 refractory glaucoma eyes that underwent uh, a diode cyclophotoprogulation, showed a 70% success rate at final follow up. But here, don't forget that success was an IOP reduction of uh, 20% and an IOP of less than or equal to 21 millimeters of mercury. So this is a fairly reasonable success rate for refractory glaucoma with a single procedure. If you look at the endoscopic device, this is what one of the devices looks like. And what is important here is a probe because a probe has a, a coaxial laser, a coaxial camera, and as, a, as well as a coaxial light source. It is an intraocular procedure. So unlike the other two procedures, you have to enter the eye, you have to make a clear corneal entry, and you typically would deliver the laser like this, and this whitening of the ciliary process that you're seeing is the end point. So this is very good when you have a very uh, sort of disorganized anterior chamber because you can then treat only that portion of the ciliary process that you want. And if there's a lot of atrophy, you can even decide not to treat them. And this is sometimes useful when you're doing uh, a procedure for the second or the third time. How does uh, endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation do with refractory glaucoma? It also does pretty well. And if you look at uh, this uh, review on endoscopic CPC, you see fairly good intraocular pressure reductions in most of the papers. But don't forget that most of them continue to need one or two or more glaucoma medications. The micropulse diode also uses a different console, even though the laser is similar. And this is what the probe looks like. The difference between the micropulse and the, di and the conventional diode is that it subdivides the energy into short pulses with specific on and off times. So a device with a 31.3 duty cycle will have an on time of 0.5 milliseconds and an off time of 1.5 milliseconds per cycle. And this minimizes heat buildup and that causes less damage to the adjacent non-treated tissue. So you basically treat this using sweeping movements. You sweep this probe adjacent to the limbus. And once you do that, you have to pass it for about 100 milliseconds. Each pass is about 10 milliseconds or so. If you look at success rates, and this is from a review that we did recently on the micropulse, using similar criteria, that is about 20% IOP reduction, you see success rates that vary between 22 and 75%. So success rates are similar to that, what you see with the di diode cyclophotocorrelation, but what is probably uh, of greater um, uh, benefit to us over here is that the risk of thysis is much lower, but you do get some patients with good vision who complain of some amount of visual acuity drop, especially in the short term. I'll uh, finish with the high intensity focus ultrasound, which uses a different principle. It uses, uh, it tries to focus light on uh, the thermal energy onto one point and prevent damage to surrounding tissues. And what happens with that is you get a very focused little band of small increases in uh, temperature, which achieve the same result as the cyclophotocoagulation. The advantage here is uh, because you have to do a UBM or an ASOCT for every patient, you, tell, you can then choose what transducer size you want, and you can therefore target the ciliary processes more accurately. And it's fairly simple. This is what the device looks like. You have a cup like this, which you place on the eye, and then this is filled with the fluid, the transducer is placed here. And that's what the eye looks like at the end of it. In our own series of about 20 eyes or 24 eyes, we found eyes with a pretty high baseline IOP of 44 millimeters. The intraocular pressure actually dropped by close to 50%. Uh, these were all uh, blind eyes and we had fairly good results with those. In terms of side effects, nothing very major. Uh, we had transient hypotony in one patient which recovered on its own, but otherwise there was nothing very major in this short, in this rather small series. So in summary, refractory glaucoma is difficult to manage. In sighted eyes or one-eyed individuals, every effort should be used to make those conventional surgical techniques before you go to cyclodestrictive procedures. And all cyclodestrictive procedures should be used with caution, both because of the risk of thysis and of uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oni George.
and uh, uh, Dr. George, do you have any questions on the uh, audience uh, list which you would like to ask? Actually, we've had a very good number of viewers. I would put it on the group later, which just tells, uh, tells us ARC that having the best uh, cream of speakers from a speciality uh, helps you have a great attendance. Oh, nearly 5,000 people have been watching us. And there are still some waiting. So before we conclude, are there any one uh, salient uh, questions which Dr. George, you would like to ask? Just one question to <clears throat> Dr. Ronnie. With the advent of uh, Cyclo G6 Micropulse, have you positioned your cyclodestructive procedures a little earlier than what you would do with uh, diode yeah. cyclophotoagregation in your glaucoma armament area? See, unfortunately, one of the problems with the uh, publications that you see on the Cyclo G6 or on the Micropulse is that there are no actually good controlled publications. There are about, uh, if you look at the literature, there are 800 odd eyes which have been treated in about 40, 50 different studies. Each of them are small studies. And the outcomes for most of them, success is defined as an IOP reduction of less than 20%, which for most of us in refractory disease is, is problematic. So I'm not really convinced that the evidence is there. And I would actually advise you to read Harry Quigley's beautiful editorial on this, where he talks about the evidence of what uh, with relation to micropulse. So I, I think the jury is still out there regarding that. Thank you, Ron. Dr. George, some more questions? No, I, I, just one more question probably for Professor Dada. Yeah. Do you see a mixed device that would be as efficacious as a trabeculectomy or a non-penetrating glaucoma surgery? And do we, in it, do we see anything in the foreseeable future for India? I think, the device which has got the best IOP lowering efficacy is the in focus microphone, which is now called the pressure flow. So that in that device, you are opening up the conjunctiva, putting mitomycin C and then putting a tube. The advantage is that it's a standardized tube, no iridectomy, and there is a slightly posterior bleb. So that device has the IOP lowering efficacy equal to trabeclectomy, but at a very exorbitant cost. So if you take away the cost, then probably it is equivalent to trabeclectomy. And that is the only device which has, which has some potential to match trabeclectomy. All others are potentially failure as far as moderate to advanced glaucoma patients are concerned. Uh, I have a question, Dr. Vinay. What would be the most diagnostic factor in congenital glaucoma, diameter of the cornea, abstri, photophobia, lacrimation, biometry, or IOP? Yeah, so the most important factor is, is the. Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. So the most the most important prognostic factor is the size of the eye. So if the eye is very large, you know, very large corneal diameters, very large axial lens corneal diameters of 14 or more, axial lengths of 24 or more. These are the eyes which are likely to have poor prognosis. Similarly, neonatal glaucomas will have poor prognosis compared to infantile glaucomas. And unilateral will always have poor prognosis compared to the bilateral ones because you can never get the amblyopia um, therapy achieved in those eyes. So, so some of them, yeah. Uh, Dr. Sunita, I have one question for you. Between AGV and RD, how do you choose one or the other? Is there any condition where one has a key advantage over the other? Yeah, actually, uh, in most of the secondary glaucomas where you uh, need immediate reduction of intraocular pressure, uh, you need to do uh, uh, AGV in such cases because uh, RD implant may take some time for the pressure to reduce because you need to tie the tube. So in uh, most of our secondary glaucomas where we need immediate reduction of intraocular pressure, I prefer to use uh, EGB. Dr. George, your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, probably I'm more biased. Uh, we use much more of the non-valve device, but if there's one, one situation where I would avoid a non-valve device is an UVIT glaucoma, where yes. chronic hypotony should be, would be a major issue, and I would go with an AGB. Also, elderly patients with very advanced glaucomatous disc damage and visual field loss, again, prefer a valve implant 
because the risk of hypotenuse uh, slightly slightly more with the non band all these publications have shown that, that there is a mild risk of uh, mild more severe risk of uh, <laughs> hypotony in the non valve implant compared to the valve implant but the benefits of having uh, much benefits of avoiding t nonces the encapsulated blips encapsulated blips with the agv tends to tilt the scale more in favor of non valve implants for me thank you one question for dr shirisha if dr george has he could ask too does a gat uh, or mgs have any role in patients with uncontrolled intraocular pressure and a failed trab as an alternative to tube no no any other question dr george no nothing else i think it's way way beyond our schedule and yeah that's true but uh, i felt that uh, <laughs> some of these speakers we have not asked them any questions at all so thanks a lot everybody i think i'll have to come up with my conclusive remarks i'm sure it's been a memorable webinar for all of us with the wonderful talks and very relevant discussions my special thanks to all my elite expert panel my very distinguished array of speakers and my very vibrant and committed moderator dr george and dr satyan we never got a chance to hear you i wonder we didn't give you a chance at all I owe my very special thanks to the AIS headquarters, Mr. Kripal and his team for his seamless commitment. Sai from Numerotech for his constant support and presence, and my very special thanks to all the attendees who were there throughout the course of the uh, webinar. And we really hope you look join us for more of our ARC programs where we need plan to cover many other specialities too. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Chitra. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.